for those of you who weren't here yesterday, my name is John Hallway. I'm the executive director here at the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice. And uh, on behalf of my colleagues, Paul Heaton, and my other colleagues at the Quattrone Center and the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, and all of my colleagues here at Penn Law, welcome back for day two of our, the fifth Innovation in Prosecution Summit. Um, we had a terrific day yesterday. Uh, and I just wanted to start off by kind of touching on some of the themes that, that, that I thought came out of the various talks yesterday, and then I'll introduce our distinguished uh, keynote speaker. So, um, you know, I, I thought today, that yesterday was a pretty, a pretty fascinating day and a day where a lot of thoughtful prosecutors who are embracing the evolving and changing role uh, had some very insightful things to say. Um, Dan Satterberg from uh, King County on the West Coast started us off with, I thought, a really great challenge. And the challenge was to face up to the realities of the societal changes we're going through and the uh, conditions of you know, long-term racial imbalances uh, that, that our communities have faced and are, and are increasingly voicing, not to back away from that or avoid those difficult conversations because they are very difficult conversations, but actually to engage with our community, engage with our employees, the assistants in an office, the other members of the community, uh, and to recognize that the power of the office allows prosecutors some, some leeway to push the envelope, to, to try new things, and to embrace the role of social justice engineer that goes beyond the role of law enforcement officer. Uh, and and to, to do things, I think the way you put it, Dan, was to do things that make you feel a little uncomfortable uh, and not to, not to shy away from that. And I thought as a, as a way to kick off the day, that was a great challenge because a lot of the com things that we're talking about are really complicated uh, and, and challenging and complex tasks. Um, and the idea of not just getting the right guy in the right way, but doing all that and now making sure we do something useful with that person to reduce crime and the added complexities that bring to the job requires that kind of uh, transparency, uh, forward-looking behavior, and leadership. Um, the, uh, in order to do that, I think one of the themes that came up was that prosecutors need more information and the, the quest for data uh, and the ways to use that data and the sources of that data need to come from beyond uh, the prosecutor's office a lot of times. Uh, DA John Chisholm talked about how prosecutors are, uh, you know, may, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe not willingly, but nonetheless in the public health business as well as being in the prosecution business. Dan, you talked about we're dealing with neurochemicals uh, and, and we have a lot of people in our communities who are injured and, and struggling, and law enforcement, both police and prosecutors, are put in positions that they didn't expect to be in when they took the job to try and deal with those people with compassion uh, and individuality and, and, and provide justice in that realm. And to do that, you need new kinds of information. And so I liked Rod Underhill's, I mean, it's a bad acronym, but I like the concept of PAVRON. Uh, professional, and by the way, he said it was a bad acronym. I'm not being critical here. Uh, doesn't, it doesn't mean it was a good acronym. So professional judgment, accountability, victim input and impact, risk assessment, offense information, meaning information about the, the things charged, uh, and a needs assessment. And that all that information needs to come together to provide the kind of support for the members in our community who are committing crime that looks at the underlying reasons that cause them to commit crime because very few of the people that we deal with in our communities are truly evil. And so trying to figure out how to help those people avoid criminal behavior uh, is, a, is an important um, way to move forward. Um, theme number two, I think, prosecutors are not in this alone and can't do this alone. Um, we talked about ways that prosecutors and defense attorneys can reach across the aisle and collaborate on projects, whether it's conviction integrity units uh, and their work, um, or, uh, or the things like the Treatment First program that Rod Underhill talked about, which includes an assessment, a pretrial assessment, where uh, the, the, the defendant in a case represented by counsel sits down and answers some very direct questions about what that person, what, what assets, what support might help that person uh, deal with their addiction, and that information has to be carefully managed and corralled, and, and Rod spoke, I think, very eloquently about the trust that's required between prosecutor and defense attorney to enable that kind of process, and how do we build that trust in an adversarial system, and I think that, that challenge is something that we'll have um, in other contexts. 
Another uh, place in which prosecutors will have to collaborate is, of course, with judges. And we talked about some of the challenges of working uh, with courts and with judges and, and in the context of risk assessment. And um, you know, I want to quote Niels Bohr, the physicist, who said, predictions are very difficult, especially when they're about the future. Right? And, and if you think about it, that's what a risk assessment tool is trying to do. And we talked about how um, the question really is, is judge plus tool making better decisions than judge alone, right? Risk assessment tools are not salvation. Uh, they're an asset to be used in decision making. Uh, and we also learned, and this is very important on the operational side, we learned from Jeff Bingham in Spokane that for God's sake, you should get a color printer if you're going to print out color graphs and ask judges to make decisions about it. There is a tool, by the way, that you can use to make triangles or squares or circles so that even if you don't have the color printer, we can discuss that later. I can show you guys that if you need it. Um, theme three, funding is important to success. And we heard from a number of prosecutors the use of their offices in conjunction with county boards and defense attorneys and other members of the system to petition for funds to, 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 to enable some of these programs. And when you're reaching out to social organizations to use funds to make sure that people are employed to implement the solutions that we're proposing and that we're testing, um, we heard from, uh, from the Manhattan DA's office that really all you need is $808 million um, in, in forfeiture funds, and you can make all sorts of great things happen. I mean, all, if you just triple the endowment of the law school. Think about the good we could do. So I would invite all of you to send that money our way. Um, but, but more seriously, the work with county boards and other stakeholders to fund diversion, uh, treatment, and engagement programs, uh, things like the universal screening program that we talked about, uh, in Milwaukee, that requires collaboration to design and execute. And once you have that collaboration in multiple agencies, it's much easier than to go to a county executive or other budgetary authority and try to bring those funds in to support that program. And we heard uh, something from Drew uh, Findling from the NACDL that I've heard some very enlightened prosecutors say as well, which is, if you really want to improve the quality of prosecution, fund public defense. Right? This is an area where the adversarial nature of the system actually makes us better. And we are better able to use the adversarial nature of the process to find truth if we have equal funding in the prosecutor and defense roles. That makes each side more able to uh, serve their role in the system of criminal justice. Uh, so we then talked about. Uh, officer-involved shootings and the Pennsylvania DA Association's approach to that. And what was interesting about that to me was how different the various jurisdictions are in the way that they handle some of these issues. They're complex, they're emotional issues. The community is very invested in them. There's lots of attention given to them. They require uh, immediate assessments, independence, and transparency. They require sensitivity for the victim and the victim's family, but also for the officer uh, and officers involved, uh, and certainly all the other officers in the department are watching very closely how this gets handled, and they're interpreting that message in terms of how you're going to take care of them. In, uh, in the transportation and safety literature, we have a, a, an expression called the second victim. And in aviation, the second victim is uh, the air traffic controller who sends a plane on a particular trajectory that then uh, results in an accident. And it's important to understand that that person is suffering from a trauma as well. And when we look at officer-involved shootings, understanding that there is a trauma that affects our officers and their colleagues, as well as the victim, the victim's family, and the community, makes this a very complex inquiry. Um, and, and how we deal with that, the transparency with, with which we deal with that, but also the sensitivity and compassion with which we, we deal with that for all parties is going to be how we're judged moving forward. Today we're going to shift gears a little bit, and we are going to continue to talk about the prosecutor-police relationship. Uh, in particular, we'll talk about body-worn cameras, which uh, bring a lot of these same issues to the fore about transparency. How are they being used? What should be released to the public? When and how? How do we store all that footage in the meantime? And we're going to talk about um, recording of interrogations. And in the background for the afternoon is why are these topics important? Well, they're, they're important because the way we think about the Brady rule and exculpatory information uh, is shifting. Um, Vanessa Antoon from the uh, NACDL said yesterday that the rule is anything exculpatory must be disclosed, and materiality is a review standard, not a disclosure standard. And I actually agree with that, but it's not clear to me that that's universally believed uh, among you know, prosecutors and defense attorneys across the country. Uh, and one of the things that, that we've said for a while here is that, you know, Brady's been on the books since 1963, so it's a 55-year-old case. 
And we continue to have these conversations about when are things material, what's materiality, when does it get applied. And again, I'll go back to the transportation literature, to Chris Hart, who used to run the NTSB. And Chris said, how many times are people going to have to trip over a step before you stop saying everybody's clumsy and you fix the step? Right? So when are we going to fix the Brady standard? Because if we're still having fights about what it means 55 years in, I don't think it's the people. I think it's the standard that's the issue. And so we'll talk about in one of our breakouts about the Michael Morton Act, which is how Texas has tried to solve that problem. They've tried to codify Brady, make it clearer, make it more objective. Uh, and we'll hear from Bill Worski, who lives in what he calls a post-Brady world, in which everything has to be turned over all the time. Uh, but the federal courts are making things interesting, too, with decisions like Alvarez versus Brownville, where they talk about whether there is an obligation to turn over Brady material if the plea bargain that you are securing occurs before the discovery deadline. So think about that. You know you have exculpatory information. You haven't been told that you have a discovery deadline, and now you can get a plea bargain. And what's the role there? And it turns out we've got a circuit split, and so we can have that conversation this afternoon as well. Now, the police context uh, happens in other, in other areas, too, such as whether we should be uh, gathering lists of police who have been subject to disciplinary actions. And uh, is that something that you're living with at all? <laughs> so litigation was filed in the city of Philadelphia on that very issue. Uh, and, uh, and so it's a topic uh, of, of, of immediate uh, urgency. Um, now, urgency is not something that academia is known for. Um, but my daughter gave me a, a clock, and the clock hangs in my office, and at every section where there would be a number on the clock, my daughter bought me a clock that says, now. And that could be because she's a 17-year-old, and that's kind of the responsiveness she expects from me. Um, but I like to think that she gave it to me as a reminder that the work we do is really important, and the fact that, um, uh, that there are people in need all the time, and there needs to be urgency in what we do. And so I was thrilled not only when D.A. Krasner agreed to come speak, but at the title of his talk, The Urgency of Now. Now, I don't know actually what he's going to say other than that, so it may be that I've completely set him up for something that he's not going to, you know, different, but, but, but I'm going to go with mine, right? The urgency of now, the work we do is really important. It's great to have uh, this group of people and the thoughtful discussion we've had. Uh, look forward to more of it today. And so I'd like to briefly introduce Pennsylvania's 26th district attorney, uh, Lawrence S. Krasner, um, who attended public school in St. Louis and Philadelphia before going and getting an undergraduate degree at the University of Chicago and a law degree from Stanford, uh, and uh, where he was on the law review. Um, he uh, received multiple offers of employment in prosecutors and defenders offices throughout the country, but came to Philadelphia uh, where he worked as a public defender from 1987 to 91. Uh, and then in the Federal Public Defender's Office, 91 to 93. Uh, in 93, he started his own private practice, specializing in criminal defense and police misconduct matters, uh, and has remained in private practice since then, trying thousands of bench and jury trials in criminal and civil court in the Philadelphia area, as well as in other counties and states. Uh, throughout his career, he has proudly demonstrated a steadfast commitment to social justice, uh, has, he's defended protesters pro bono who were involved with move, movements including ACT UP, Black Lives Matter, the progressive clergy with power, Casino Free Philadelphia, DACA, Dreamers, Decarcerate Pennsylvania, uh, he, Heeding God's Call and anti-gun clergy, uh, and others. Uh, he's lived in Philadelphia for over 30 years. Uh, his wife has been a judge on the Court of Common Pleas for 17 years, and they have two adult sons. Uh, and we're absolutely thrilled to have him here today uh, kicking us off and uh, leading what I think is going to be a great conversation for the rest of the day. Mr. DA. So John just gave my speech, and therefore, thank you very much. I'll sit down. Uh, so it is kind of great to be here with a national organization of prosecutors who represent the future, who actually have a belief that we can change things and that we can do things in a way that is more than inframarginal, in a way that is more than incremental, that we don't need to wait 30 years after an idea is a good idea to act on it. Unfortunately, that's not what we, what we always see in government, and that's not what we always see in our local, and by local, I mean statewide, prosecutors associations. In my various travels, I've gotten to know several 
of the uh, progressive prosecutors from some of the major jurisdictions, Kim Fox, Kim Og, George Gascon in San Francisco, many others. And what you hear from people who've been around for a little while is that to some extent within their own states, they are outliers. They are an outpost. They are trying to speak to the future and they're in a room full of prosecutors from usually rural jurisdictions who only want to talk about the past and do not see that way forward. Well, what I really want to talk about today is timing, and that is the reason for the title, Urgency of Now. For those of you who may not recall, at the beginning of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, given, of course, in front of the Washington Memorial, he said something that he said many other times which is that there is a fierce urgency of now, that tomorrow is today. He was far more articulate than I'll ever be, and I'm not gonna read it word for word, but that is essentially what he said. You cannot wait, you cannot proceed at the pace that makes government and bureaucracy comfortable. Not moving now can be moving too late, and the consequences can be permanent. Why are we talking about this? Well, so strangely enough, Donald Trump, who spent the midterms appealing to people who have Confederate flag bumper stickers on their trucks in rural areas, decided now is the time for criminal justice reform, a few days after getting trounced in the midterms. Who knew? Sometimes these things can be explained as, as being due to personal connections. Yes, Jared Kushner's father was convicted by a person we all know of federal crimes. Yes, this is a bill that applies federally. But we, have seen, we are seeing this bizarre duality of a president who plays footsie with white supremacists, and then a few days later, when he himself is under criminal scrutiny from federal authorities, decides that now is the time for criminal justice reform. Some people might say this is a cynical effort on his part, having frankly waved a racist flag, talking about invading people in a caravan, describing innocent, harmless people as criminals. Some people might think that this is a cynical political move which is understanding that his position is considerably weakened, now he's going to claim that he is a friend to people of color. That, as we all know, there is a discriminatory and racist systemic nature to the beast, and so now he's going to be opposed to that beast when his other tactics are not useful on a given day. I don't actually think much of that matters. I think what matters is that that is just one more of many signs that there is an opportunity there is a timing that is crucial that we all need to recognize because those of us who are looking for a future for criminal justice, those of us who believe that the pressing civil rights issue of our time is criminal justice reform and is, among other things, the end of mass incarceration, need to take a look at this moment and this opportunity and this urgency of now. So Van Jones hangs out with Newt Gingrich the Koch brothers keep coming around like kittens looking for milk. Go figure, what is going on? Well, I think one of the things that's going on is that there are people on the left who have a vision of criminal justice that has us not being the most incarcerated country in the world that is perhaps based on notions of equality and uh, a beloved society, something of that sort. But there are people on the right, who I think at one point we would have called fiscal Republicans, who have been talking in terms of cost and benefit for a very long time. They are fans of a free market. And what they see when they see mass incarceration is they see big government. In fact, they see way too big government. And they are absolutely right, because it is way too big government when you're spending so much money on incarceration that there are for sale signs on public school buildings in Philadelphia. And the class size of the public schools in Philadelphia, which are doing, frankly, not as well as they could, is about 35 for a given teacher. 
a hell of a lot more than when I came out of public school, when I was looking at 22 in a well-funded public school system. So we have this moment when fiscal Republicans and people on the left both believe change is necessary. We have this moment when the most unpredictable and frankly menacing weather vane of a president of my lifetime is in favor of criminal justice reform and is able to do this even on the heels of a massive defeat in the midterms. He is able somehow to do this. What has he really done? I mean, honestly, not much. What this bill actually has done is it affects the approximately 7% of cases that are disposed of in the federal system, which leaves the other 93% to us. What this bill actually does in a backward looking fashion is it seeks to rectify discrepancies between the treatment of crack and the treatment of cocaine in terms of the already excessive sentencing guidelines. This is a nice thing. However, there's been a fair amount of success in that realm already, and it's been going on for a very long time. What does it seek to do in a forward-looking way? Well, it seeks to give more discretion to judges over sentencing guidelines that were already advisory, but that's a good thing. And there are some other, there are some other aspects to it. They seem to finally be a little bit offended by the idea of life without parole for a third drug offense where there are not weapons involved. I mean, that is a good thing. So it does a few things within the narrow realm of federal prosecution. It makes things a little bit better. But again, I think more than anything, what it represents is that even in the politics of Donald Trump's America, he feels a reason to move on these issues. One aspect of being a public defender or having worked in a system, like at least like the system in Philadelphia for a very long time, as if you have been a public defender or you have been on the defense side or you have been a plaintiff civil rights attorney, you have gone through 30 years, in my case, of beatdowns. Not that I didn't win, I actually won a lot. But you have often been the second most despised person in the room when you came in the room and said that sentence is too long or those civil rights apply. You have often been someone who was subjected to a gauntlet in which in many instances, you had a prosecutorial entity that told the judges what to do. And no matter how integrous those judges were, there was tremendous pressure on those judges to do what that prosecutorial entity wanted, or it would turn to the press. And it would use the press as its propaganda arm to tell the kinds of stories that they're comfortable telling. Individual stories about individual and terrible crimes that got us to the following. For 30 years, Americans have been polled and they have been asked, is crime going up or is crime going down? 65% of them for 30 years have said it is going up when it was for 30 years going down. You wanna talk about how you get bad policies? Try this, have an entire electorate living in a fantasy world. A fantasy world generated by politicians and a press with whom they had a symbiotic relationship whose actual motivations were ambition, personal self-promotion, incumbency, and the sale of media, the sale of, I guess at the moment, it would be clicks, rather than the motivations that citizens and voters actually expect, which are motivations to seek justice. This all sounds a little gloomy first thing in the morning, I understand, and um, you are welcome to you are welcome to have more coffee as you endure this gloom. But there is a point to it, I promise. And there is a little bit of, of sunshine that will come out from behind the clouds in a moment. So that's where we are. We find ourselves sometimes, especially as elected officials, we find ourselves in a position where every political operative is telling us, don't do it. Don't do it so quickly. Not now. Don't do it. Well, they are all 100% completely wrong. And they are wrong for moral reasons, but they're also wrong for political reasons. Because the reality is that voters are sick of inframarginal change. And voters are sick of a government that moves at an unacceptably slow pace. They are looking for change. This can have its dangerous side, as in our current presidency, but it can also have its incredibly fruitful and helpful 
side. I would not have gotten elected if it were not for the fact that voters in Philadelphia recognized and went way past the politics of identity, recognized that their position on the future of criminal justice reform looked nothing like the way the system itself operated and looked nothing like what the system itself thought made sense in terms of a future. So we find ourselves in a time when there's some bipartisan support for criminal justice reform. Amazingly enough, we find a guy playing footsie with white supremacists who wants to do some criminal justice reform, even if it's not the biggest thing in the world. So what are we afraid of? What is slowing us down? How do we get there? We all know that prosecutors, perhaps more than any elected official, any elected official, have the power to unilaterally do certain things. Uh, Dan Satterberg spoke to my attorneys yesterday, and he said something, a lot of things that were very interesting, but one of the very interesting things he said was that the reason the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program was, done, was formulated the way it was, and this of course is a pre-arrest diversion program primarily directed at people who are suffering from addiction, also people in you know, a related situation such as sex workers. The reason he did it that way is he really didn't want to go to the legislature or the courts for their buy-in, because it wouldn't get done. So he did it directly with police who bought in. Well, that is a reflection of the reality that when we make a decision to bring a case or not, to charge a case a certain way or not, to divert a case or not, when we do that, we have the power to do that unilaterally. We do not have to do what a member of the U.S. House of Representatives has to do, which is I will trade my good idea for your pork barrel, and I will compromise on X so you can give me Y. We don't have to do that. We actually have the ability to do what Dr. King was talking about, to act on this urgency of now. So let me talk to you about the situation of Pennsylvania, and let me talk to you a little bit about statewide prosecutors associations and how we might want to think about them. So the situation in Pennsylvania, which undoubtedly views itself as a somewhat uh, snobby northeastern state, or perhaps some of you think of it in those terms, is pretty alarming. The reality is that while the country has gone to a 500 percent level of increase in incarceration, Pennsylvania has succeeded in an 800 percent increase over the last 40 years. During almost all of that time, there has been a statewide organization, which is the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association. It represents a pro uh, about 66 counties, not exactly. Every single member right now, every single member in 2018 is white. 80 to 85 percent of them are men. Um, the women who are in there, some of whom I know rather well, are of an extremely conservative bent, frankly, from what I've seen, no less conservative than the men involved. And that organization has represented itself as speaking with a singular voice in the legislature for all that time. They are the ones, not the only ones, but they are the ones who got us an 800 percent level of increase in incarceration. Pennsylvania had the most juvenile lifers in the country, which means it had the most juvenile lifers in the world. Many of those lifers were, many of those juvenile lifers were sentenced to death before the U.S. Supreme Court said unconstitutional, and then they were sentenced to life without the possibility of parole before the U.S. Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. Pennsylvania succeeded in having more juveniles doing life than any place in the world. And that happened during the period of time that the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association presumed to speak with a singular voice to the legislature. We are, only, we are one of only four states where you can be a person who is involved in a robbery, you never touch the gun, someone dies during that robbery, and you're going to do life without any possibility of parole. There are only four states that do that. Once again, who was there? The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, which, by the way, used to run out of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, and was created by a, Phil by a Philadelphia District Attorney. It does not run out of the Philadelphia DA's office anymore, and we will talk about that in a moment. Pennsylvania has the fifth largest death row in the United States. You know, a lot of Northeastern snobs want to make jokes about Mississippi and Alabama, and Louisiana and Texas. Not so much.
So how do we get here? Well, Pennsylvania, I think very much like California, faces what may be the most immediate divide in this country, which is the divide between urban and suburban areas on the one hand and rural areas on the other hand. You should know that I am from Missouri. I am not from Philadelphia. My mother's people were farmers in the St. Charles, Troy, Missouri area, all of them, hunters, all of them. I have no beef with people who are from a, a rural background. That is where I used to go as a kid for Thanksgiving. But there is a real divide, and it is exactly the divide that our president tried to cynically exploit, although it kind of backfired on him because it turns out the suburban people don't feel quite the same way. There is a real divide. That divide is not just something that was whipped up. That divide is real. And let me talk to you about it in terms of how Pennsylvania incarcerates people. So there are many state prisons in Pennsylvania. There are none in Philadelphia County. And as those of you who are probably familiar with John Pfaff's PFAFF, John Pfaff, John Pfaff's work locked in may have noted, you have three different aspects to why it is that rural counties which produce state legislators who write state laws like incarceration. The first is they don't have coal and steel anymore. They need industry. Having a prison that employs a lot of people helps to maintain your economy, even if it's public. And we don't have a whole lot of private prison activity in Pennsylvania, but it helps to maintain your economy. That part's simple. How about this part? The United States Census counts an individual who was born in Philadelphia and lived in Philadelphia until the minute that person was sent to jail in Center County. They count that person in a jail cell as being a resident of Center County. There are 13,000 of these people from Philadelphia, approximately, in state prisons all over. Who cares? Well, I'll tell you who cares. Government funders care. Highway funders care because this is based, in many, many instances, on population. So if Center County can get highway funds for a person sitting in a jail cell from Philadelphia who's never going to drive a car because they're in a jail cell, and if they did drive a car, they'd go back to Philly, if Center County can do that, that's not hurting them with their highways. What about gerrymandering? Nobody does gerrymandering better than our conservative brothers. What about that? Well, if you can import Philadelphians, put them in a cage, and say, we got another voter, sort of, here. You might be in a jail cell and not vote, but we got another voter. It gives you power. So we're talking straight up money. We're talking government money. And we're talking governmental power. We have a motivated bunch of rural counties, motivated, who want to have our Philadelphians, often black and brown Philadelphians, in their jails. Because it gives them power and it gives them money. Speaking of gerrymandering, guess how the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association votes? Imagine the U.S. Senate without the U.S. House, where Vermont gets just as many votes as Philadelphia. Philadelphia County is the most important criminal justice jurisdiction, at least in terms of the uh, amount of crime and the amount of individuals who are sent into custody. It represents 27% of the people who are in state custody, and it has its own county system, which it has a declining population, but at one point looked like 10,000 people. It now looks like about 4,960 people. So it kind of matters what happens in Philadelphia. But if you give Philadelphia one vote and you give Center County one vote, then obviously this entire system with over 60 counties is going to skew away from Pittsburgh, which is a major jurisdiction, skew away from Philadelphia. It's going to place power in the hands, even within the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, it's going to place power in their hands that we don't recognize as being appropriate in terms of our federal democracy. That is one of the things that goes on with the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association. The membership of that organization is 30% Philadelphian because it includes assistant district attorneys, assistant attorneys general. 30% of their membership is Philly. And what have they been doing? Well, I know this is not an isolated situation because I have spoken to my progressive prosecutor buddies from other cities, but what they have been doing is 
being the voice of the past. They have not only defended the terrible record of their policies being the problem that got Pennsylvania to where it is, they are doubling down to do it again, much like Jeff Sessions was doubling down on a brand new war on drugs. They are doubling down on a brand new war on drugs. You want some specifics? Pennsylvania District Attorney's Association aggressively supported House Bill 741, which would restore many mandatory minimum sentences in Pennsylvania. They're currently out because they were written in violation of a lien, and therefore most of our mandatories went away a few years ago. But they'd like to restore them. This legislation, needless to say, would tie the hands of both DAs and judges to do what we pay judges to do, which is to make individual judgments that arrive at individual justice in individual cases. It has been reported this would cost the state at least $80 million in the first year and $200 million a year after that. Needless to say, it would also drive up our mass incarceration. 800% is not enough. That is the position of an organization in which until very recently, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office was a member. We are no longer members of that organization. They have opposed our governor's longstanding moratorium on the death penalty, and they did so disregarding a bipartisan report which laid out multiple deep flaws in how the death penalty is applied in Pennsylvania, and they opposed the basic reforms that would fix some of those flaws. The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association came out in favor of all juvenile lifers receiving a sentence of a minimum of 35 years to life upon resentencing, regardless of prison adjustment or length of sentence. Once again, an effort to take away discretion, but more to the point, a complete and utter violation of what the United States Supreme Court, through the mouth of a conservative court, said was required which was to recognize the difference between children and adults, to recognize that they have a greater capacity for rehabilitation and not to simply focus on the initial crime, but to focus on the adjustment and the changes that have occurred. I guess the US Supreme Court doesn't even apply when it comes to the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association. They opposed Senate Bill 293, which would have allowed defendants convicted of felony murder, meaning our second degree murder, the one I was speaking of in terms of a robbery gone wrong, that would disallow the, the possibility of parole. This legislation would have finally addressed the issues of automatic life without parole sentences in the context, not of a first degree, but of a second degree murder. As I mentioned before, we are one of only four states that went down this road, and they opposed that change. They have opposed what should be completely non-controversial reforms designed to prevent the conviction of innocent people, they have opposed recording witness and defendant interviews and confessions. They have opposed easier access to DNA. Who wants the truth, right? They are now doubling down on the war on drugs. They want to increase the offense gravity score for fentanyl, and they even want to do it in situations where the reality is many people who are uh, either using or selling white powder that they consider to be opioids don't know whether they have heroin or they have fentanyl. Nevertheless, it turns out the answer to this crisis is not to have our president screw down on the supply of pills, which has increased 400% in the last 10 years. It is not to stop our president from doing what he just did, which is to approve a form of opioid 10 times stronger than fentanyl. It's not that. The way to do this is that incredibly successful war on drugs that we started 30 some years ago, that everybody who's open-minded recognizes has been a complete failure. It has simply furthered the stigmatization of people who suffer from a mental disorder, which is called addiction. The drugs are the symptom. They don't cause the crime. They are the symptom. They are the symptom of trauma, they're a symptom of genetic predisposition. This is a medical issue. And yet we have a Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association which presumes to speak with one voice, no longer mine, that would have you believe that the war on drugs all over again is a good idea for their own incumbency, 
for their own ambition, for the economies of their own counties. They've even been down on legalization of marijuana, which has become an incredible engine for public schools all over the country. Kills no one, unlike brown liquor, which I guarantee you, every one of my, no, maybe not everyone, almost every one of my Pennsylvania district attorney colleagues drinks in the evening. They're not even okay with that. So they are, in fact, the voice of the past. And if I sound a little indignant, I am. The reason I am a little indignant is that for the past 10 and a half months, they have been representing that with the Philadelphia District Attorneys Association as a member, in fact, with the Philadelphia District, Attorney, with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, excuse me, as 30% of their membership, we're all on the same page. That is what they have been doing. They have been wrapping the legitimacy of the decisions voters made in this particular jurisdiction, our efforts to connect to a future in not an incremental, but in a serious way, they have been claiming that Philadelphia supports this absolute nonsense, this throwback set of policies, and we do not. I look forward to a time when progressive prosecutors can work effectively in their statewide district attorneys associations, and I know that in some states you can. All of this is actually very much a local thing. But I need to make sure, at least here, and I hope you will make sure where you are, that the experience of having been the idealistic outsider, the experience of being David, does not slow you down when you become Goliath. Because we are all, those of us who seek a future that looks like criminal justice reform, we are all becoming the Goliath. We are taking over in elections in the major jurisdictions all across the country. And what this means for now is that in Pennsylvania, when legislators go to consider what they're going to do, there's a couple things that they're going to think about. Well, it looks like President Trump, when he's not cheering on Confederate flag-wearing folks, looks like he likes criminal justice reform. It looks like maybe the suburbs are hanging with the cities. And needless to say, both of those areas are more affected by crime than many of the rural areas. And there are exceptions. I understand that. It looks like some of these wins, let's just talk about, for example, Wesley Bell in St. Louis County. Wesley was supposed to lose. He was supposed to win. He couldn't even get labor support with the exception of maybe one union. Everybody was shaking their head. He won by 13 points. And he did so against a 26-year incumbent who was completely embedded with the kind of police force we saw in Ferguson. Things are changing. We are becoming the Goliath. We are at a point where we cannot afford to let our experience as people who've been trying to change things incrementally, because that's the best we could do, slow us down. There is, simply put, a fierce urgency of now that we move forward. As an organization, this is a great way to connect to people who may have found themselves in statewide organizations isolated or patronized, who may have thought, well, if I hang in here long enough, some of these people will listen to me some. And yeah, they will. It may be that the best thing in your particular jurisdiction is to hang in there with that organization. I look forward to a day when I could rejoin that organization. But the reality is, what I feel in Pennsylvania now is a fierce urgency of now that says no. The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association will not claim the legitimacy of its most important criminal justice jurisdiction in trying to take us back 40 years. No. And therefore, we have made a decision to separate from that. I know that you will all face other decisions, dramatic and mundane, and I know that you will make the right decisions, but I would just ask you to take away one thing from you. Please don't forget the phrase, the urgency of now. Thank you. We're going to go right into the next uh, presentation. And I know an issue like body-worn cameras um, probably doesn't relate to your jurisdiction. There's no discovery issues. Uh, there's no situations where uh, uh, the amount of staff time required just to look at, at those uh, videos. 
um, is, is just incredible. And I can also say from the association level, we, we have consistently been voiced to say, look, you ought to involve prosecutors in those decisions. We are the end users, we have the discovery obligations, and these are our are, are key things. Um, we're very pleased to have a panel, and, and we have bracketed both coasts. So David had joined us, David from LA City, had, had joined our major county meeting this past summer and talked about the work that his office has done with Temple University from, and funded by our friends from the Arnold Foundation to have some real facts, details, what is the effect of the body-worn cameras. And then as we were getting ready for the presentation, Jan raised her hand, Jan from, from Baltimore City, and said, wait, as, as part of that presentation over the summer, while one, and, and, and being from California, where you're looking to review cases, whether you should file, with Baltimore City, it's the other way. The officers have already brought, the individual's already been charged, but do we proceed and go forward with the case? So I'm really pleased to have, not only have we bracketed both coasts, but we have two very different offices, very large offices, huge volume with, with the respective LAPD in, in Baltimore, to uh, give some thoughts and direction and to have some real stats, numbers, and real work. Because I love the discussion about urgency of now. My thing is always do something. These are two particular offices that, that are doing. So I think, David, you said you're going to open? Yes. It's all yours. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to John and the Quattrone Center and Penn Law, to David and the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys for this fifth innovation in Prosecution Summit and for the opportunity for our office to present to you, along with the Office of the State's Attorney in Baltimore City, regarding body-worn cameras, which is innovating prosecution throughout the country especially in our offices. And on behalf of the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office and our innovative and elected city attorney, Mike Feuer, I want to thank you for this. Our office under Mike Feuer has shown a commitment to transparency so that we can learn from ourselves and that others can learn from us. And therefore, we opened up our office two Temple University researchers in, uh, based upon funding from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation to research the very beginning of where our office comes into contact with the criminal justice system, and that is our decision to file charges or not. And therefore, in this presentation, I'm going to discuss the research subject, the research itself in the study, and then the solutions that were found from that research. The subject is the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office, resulting from the body-worn camera program in the Los Angeles Police Department. Sir, can you look a little behind you? If possible, yes. I think it's on the news and screen, but I don't know. Thank you very much, John. And I'm gonna start with the Los Angeles Police Department because that's where most of the conversation regarding body-worn cameras happens, which is with the police department. There was little thought regarding the effects on prosecutors when body-worn camera programs were being discussed and started, especially in the case of the city of Los Angeles, as you'll see. LAPD has over 10,000 uniformed officers, 2,800 civilian employees, uh, patrolling the city of Los Angeles, which covers 468 square miles and a population of 4 million people. The Los Angeles Police Department in 2015, based upon a decision by its civilian board of police commissioners, approved its body-worn camera program. 
that approval came in the form of special order number 12, which is a publicly available document. It spells out the protocols and procedures and motivations for LAPD's body worn camera program. One of the six bulleted reasons for LAPD starting the body worn camera program was to collect evidence for use in criminal investigations and prosecutions. The, those prosecutions in the, from the city of Los Angeles occur in two major, uh, are, are forwarded to two major offices. The Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, which is headed by its elected district attorney, Jackie Lacey, which handles all of the felony crimes that occur in the city of Los Angeles, as well as the county as a whole, and the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office, which handles all of the misdemeanor prosecutions that occur in the city of Los Angeles. From that 2015 approval, June 2016 comes around and the Los Angeles City Council decides to expand the program, committing $69.6 .6 million to LAPD's body worn camera program to fund the deployment of 7,000 of cameras for 7,000 uniformed officers. That's 70% of the officers that are sworn in the city of Los Angeles. Deployment was done division by division. There are 21 area divisions in those 468 square miles, as well as specialized units. Deployment was considered complete as of July 2018. Our office has 553 attorneys as of yesterday. It handles not only the criminal prosecutions that occur in the city of Los Angeles for misdemeanors, but also civil, municipal, and proprietary, such as the Harbor Department, Airport, and Department of Water and Power. Within the criminal and special litigation branch, we have 242 prosecuting attorneys as of September of 2018, split among six geographic branches and 12 specialized units, each of which files its own cases. The city attorney's office, throughout the period of the research, which was from October 2015 through April of 2018, reviewed almost 80,000 cases per year. During that entire period, there were over 200,000 cases that were reviewed for filing consideration. When the city council approved that $69.6 .6 million for LAPD's body worn camera program, how much do you think was committed to the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office in order to effectuate the collection or the use of that evidence in criminal investigations and prosecutions? I see someone in the back <laughs> raising up this. Zero. No money was provided to our office at that time for the collection or for the prosecution of the evidence that was collected by LAPD. Time goes further in 2016 to December with only 1,000 of the 7,000 body worn cameras that were deployed. Our office possessed approximately 15,000 recordings. We requested funding in 2017 we now possess approximately 95,000 body worn camera recordings and we average receipt of 5,000 per month. These two graphs show the dramatic increase beginning in January 2017 of body worn camera video receipts as well as the yellow and the orange reflect, yellow reflects gigabytes and orange reflects hours. And the hours ultimately will be a very important factor later on in this presentation. You'll also see that when that spike occurred in 2017, there also was an increase in the amount that was viewed, but it doesn't mirror what we were receiving. Given all of that, we had the fortune to work with uh, three researchers, two of them based out of Temple University, Professors Elizabeth Groff and Jeffrey Ward from the Department of Criminal Justice, as well as another researcher who's a lecturer at the University of California, San Diego, and is a former crime analyst coordinator for the San Diego County District Attorney's Office and a crime analyst for the San Diego Police Department in Julie Wartell. Their researcher, research was made possible by a grant from the Laura 
and John Arnold Foundation. And they asked three questions. One, does the presence of body-worn camera video footage change the filing rates for crimes? Two, what are the factors that influence whether filing attorneys evaluate body-worn camera video footage in making filing decisions? And three, does the decision to evaluate body-worn camera video vary by crime type? And this research, given that the theme of this conference is innovation, was innovative in itself, just like there was not much thought given to the prosecution side when it comes to funding and the implementation of body-worn camera programs, there also is not much research when it comes to how body-worn camera videos affect prosecutions. And therefore, this research is one of the first that's primarily devoted to the prosecution side of body-worn camera. They approached the research in three ways. One, focus groups. They met with 15 deputy city attorneys from five of our geographic branches and two of our specialized units to identify ideas and challenges. And two, to develop a data collection form that you'll see in a moment that was used in the primary data collection, which was the second part of their approach. That approach, um, in that form, it determined the extent of the usage from targeted in-depth data from 19 deputy city attorneys who filed on a regular basis, and it examined the variation in usage by case circumstances, such as custody, type of misdemeanor, and the types of misdemeanors you'll see later, they ended up grouping into three different categories based upon how body-worn camera evidence affected that usage. And three, official data from our case, criminal case management system, which is our proprietary in-house management system, uh, whether the presence of body-worn camera affected filing rates. And the study period was October 1, 2015 through April 30th of 2018. Here is a copy of the um, primary data collection form that was given to the 19 filers. Type of case, um, did you review it? If you reviewed it, um, why did you review it? Did you know it was available? How many did you review? How many, how many minutes did you spend on it? And uh, why did you watch it? And from there, all three of those approaches, they came up with answers to their questions. Does the presence of body-worn camera video footage change filing rates for crimes? Yes, but not necessarily how you expect. First, cases were significantly more likely to be filed when body-worn camera evidence was available as compared to when it was unavailable. But 72.5% of cases with body-worn camera video that were not viewed were filed, whereas when they were viewed before filing, 64.1% of cases were filed. This raises the possibility that the knowledge of body-worn camera availability increases the likelihood of filing a case, but less so when the video is actually viewed. The overall filing rate for all cases during the study period was considerably lower, and it consistently is in the 52, the low 50% range for all offenses. The filing rates were 63% for all offenses during the study period that had the same ch charge codes as the subset of charges with body-worn camera video. Cases where video were viewed had a lower filing percentage, 45 to 51, and a higher, higher rejection rate, 45 versus 39. If the same proportions occurred in a larger sample, it would suggest that the use of body-worn camera evidence by attorneys reviewing cases reduces the proportion of cases being filed. And that statistic comes from the primary data collection part of the study. What are the factors that influence whether filing decisions evaluate body-worn camera video footage in making filing decisions? 84.3% of the DCAs did not use body-worn camera evidence because case was either a filing or a reject without the evidence. 
14.4% of cases for which body-worn camera evidence was not used in filing because the filing attorney did not know if it was available or not. 8.3% of cases in which the evidence was watched, but our attorney indicated that they would have liked to watch it, but did not have the time to do so. Last question, does the decision to evaluate body-worn camera video vary by crime type? Yes, especially when it comes to crimes of domestic violence, driving under the influence, especially when there's a refusal of testing, such as chemical testing or field sobriety <coughs> testing, battery on a peace officer, and resisting arrest. Given the different crime types, the researchers came up with three separate categories to define body-worn camera footage in relation to that crime type. Category A includes all offenses likely to be captured on body-worn cameras, in whole or in part. In other words, one of where, whenever there's either the entire offense is captured or an element or more is captured, that falls into category A. Category B includes all offenses not in category A in which stronger circumstantial evidence is likely to be captured on body-worn cameras, such as the effect of the offense, the injury, damage, statements from either the defendant, the victim, or the witness to see the demeanor of them all, especially in domestic violence cases. And then category C includes offenses that have weaker circumstantial evidence or are not likely to capture much evidence at all. There's additional major findings that the study came up with. And the final study has not been published yet, so know that all of these numbers that I'm spelling out for you and that are included on these slides will not be finalized until the report is published, which we anticipate being soon. But there was a very low usage of body-worn camera video in the filing decision. No more than 8% of the time was it used to, in the process of filing a case. That being said, even though one of the issues is the lack of time in which to watch body-worn camera footage, it was used twice as often in custody cases in which we were facing timelines in which to file those charges while the defendant was still in custody. Approximately double the amount of time when we had custody cases did we review it as opposed to non-custody cases. Despite its low usage, 90% of our attorneys thought it was helpful in the filing decision when they did review the video. And why did those 90% believe it was assistive even though, or why was it low even though it was assistive? Because on average there were 4.5 to 5.6 videos per case and the average length of video in minutes per case was 135 minutes. It's now 139 minutes. So what solutions can come about from this research and what have we done in our office to impose some of these solutions? One, teamwork. Given there's gonna be a conversation regarding Brady later on today and Brady's been a topic of conversation throughout this summit, part of our team as the prosecution team is the law enforcement agencies that bring us cases to file charges. So we need to communicate and collaborate with our law enforcement agencies that submit cases for filing. Obtain and understand the protocol of the body-worn camera program, such as in Special Order Number 12 with LAPD. Know and establish or adjust the protocols of sharing body-worn camera evidence. And if there are multiple law enforcement agencies in your jurisdiction and each of them uses different body-worn camera manufacturers and cloud storage software for coll collection and usage of that body-worn camera footage, arrange meetings between and amongst all those agencies to try to come to common ground as to how, those, how that evidence is gonna be shared with your office. When to share. Our office from the get-go wanted body-worn camera evidence to be submitted to us upon presentation of a case for filing consideration. That did not happen. In order for it to have the effect that it could, 
it's important to stress to your law enforcement agencies, submit the evidence to us when you present the case for filing. What to share? All recordings that are made from a particular case and only the recordings that are made from a particular case. In our experience, there was no identifiable way to, um, in, to figure out which videos apply to which particular case. When LAPD established special order number 12, they only required officers to categorize the particular piece of evidence, which categories for purposes of body-worn camera evidence, at least in our situation, deals with retention, as well as for us, the category, for the most part, was misdemeanor arrest, which that applies to all of our cases. It wasn't until March of 2018 that LAPD changed its policy and required officers to identify each and every recording with the 12-digit incident number for which that recording was made, and only that 12-digit incident number for which that recording was made. They should share the exact copy of recordings with us and allow us to do any redactions that is necessary because we want to make sure that we have everything that is in the possession of the Los Angeles Police Department and that all the evidence should be grouped together in one case so that all the evidence for one incident should be grouped together in one case to make it easier and more accessible for our attorneys. Uh, LAPD's contract is with Axon, which also um, hosts evidence.com. Evidence.com is created so that when the law enforcement agency goes to create a case and add evidence to that case, if they title the case with the 12 digit incident number or whatever they title it with, if there's any evidence that has been identified by an officer that matches that title of the case, evidence.com is gonna auto suggest that evidence be added to the case, and then that case can be shared with our office. So the 2018 modification to requiring incident numbers and the technology that evidence.com offers allows for all evidence and only the evidence from our particular incident to be shared with us so that we know we have it. Lastly, with whom to share, it would be helpful to decide should it be shared with the entire office with the particular unit that's filing it or particular attorneys. It's also important to stress to your uh, prosecution team, law enforcement agencies, to identify each and every officer that was present at the scene and whether or not body-worn camera videos were, cameras were activated because oftentimes the reports can only include the officers who were first on scene or collected the evidence that was germane to the offense and isn't going to include everybody else who ended up showing up to provide assistance. But if those officers who did show up to provide assistance turn on their cameras, that is potentially few other discovery that must be obtained by our office to comply with our constitutional or statutory discovery or disclosure obligations. Technology for your offices. If your technology does not support efficient and effective review of body-worn camera evidence, your personnel will be inefficient. Bandwidth. There was one of our filing branches that did not have sufficient bandwidth in order to use evidence.com, and therefore that delayed the uh, implementation of body-worn cameras in the divisions that, that provided cases to that particular branch. Additionally, there's another branch that consistently had internet outages, and therefore their attorneys had a very difficult time using body-worn camera uh, evidence on a consistent basis. Computers, operating systems, and browsers. Our office currently uses computers that are, uh, operate on Windows 7. Windows 7 is going to be no longer supported by Microsoft come 2020. So our office is in the process of figuring out how to refresh our computers in order to deal with that lack of support. And what we're doing, 
even yesterday, they installed a, uh, a docking system for a laptop in my office as well as that in one of our paralegal's offices to test dockable laptops to replace desktops given how much digital evidence, including body-worn camera evidence, we're receiving and the requirements to be able to use that in court. Monitors, it's important to have a second monitor if possible for efficient review of body-worn camera footage as well as to be able to make notes regarding what you're viewing or to be able to fill out your filing paperwork as you're reviewing the video. Headphones, having quality headphones will allow you to hear what is being said on that body-worn camera footage as well as to prevent noise interference with those that work around you and then storage. As you saw, the amount of gigabytes that we're adding up on because of the amount of body-worn camera footage we're getting, um, so is the, the storage capability. You need to train your filing attorneys on how to use your body-worn camera footage, how to find it, how to locate it. As you saw, a lot of our attorneys felt that they did not have access to it. So it's incumbent upon our office to go out and train all of our different units about Special Order Number 12, how that evidence is shared with us, and how they can access it so that they can use it. <coughs> also train them on the law. Um, up on the board is a quote from Borden Kircher versus Hayes, which is the United States Supreme Court case. It says that in our system, so long as the prosecutor has probable cause to believe that the accused committed an offense defined by statute, the decision whether or not to prosecute and what charges to file or bring before a grand jury generally rests entirely in his discretion, which mirrors the words by um, the district attorney from King County, King County, Mr. Satterberg. And ultimately, so long as the reason for selectivity is not based upon anything that's invidious, that um, the conscious exercise of discretion, whether to watch body-worn camera footage or not, is not going to be problematic. But, and prosecutors are vested with a lot of discretion, but that discretion has limits. Also, uh, your ethical obligation, according to the American Bar Association, that the prosecutor in a criminal case shall refrain from prosecuting a charge that the prosecutor knows is not supported by probable cause. Lastly, time. The Prosecutor Center for Excellence recently repeated that for every uh, position, or for every 100 cameras that are in the field, your office will need one position. Based upon the research and those hours that I mentioned, given the body-worn camera footage, which ended up being 4,124 hours, and the average per minute is 135 per case and 79,853 cases per year results in 89.8 full-time equivalents. With that funding that we obtained in 2017, our office has 14 full-time positions, seven attorneys, seven paralegals. We currently have four interns and we're adding two more. Paralegals and interns can greatly assist in reviewing the body-worn camera footage before an attorney reviews it to point out within that footage where are the important factors that should be considered by the attorney. Where's the admission? Where's the statement? And any other items that are of potential significance so that the attorney can review those particular moments and not the entirety of the 135 minutes on average per case. So I'm gonna reserve questions and answers until after Baltimore City makes their presentation from their state attorney's office. Thank you very much. All right, get ready. We got some video, body-worn camera. All right, so in, in Baltimore City, we have a completely different process because in Baltimore City, 
Our police charge almost everything. So both in district court and in our circuit court, there we go, okay. Both in our district court and our circuit court, Baltimore City BPD charges. So basically what happens is Baltimore City, the, the police department of Baltimore City will bring all charges in district court. And that's our lowest trial court. The state's attorney's office will obviously try the misdemeanors, but the felonies need to be reviewed by an attorney. And that's usually done by our division chiefs, and we, and we have some felony reviewers. And that case will either be reduced and stay in district court, or it will be indicted because it's a felony, and it'll come to circuit court, which is our highest level trial court. Now, there are some categories of crimes that the BP, that BPD and the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office work together to discuss whether or not to bring charges. And those are homicides, police-involved crimes, um, and major drug and gang investigations. There are some outliers on that. If we have takedowns for a, a, a drug organization, that may happen. But basically, Baltimore City Police Department charges all crimes. All right, so. In January of 2015, just when we started our first term, this program had already begun. But we were able to squeak in to the last task force meeting. And I remember sitting there, and everybody had everything planned out. And I raised my hand, and I said, OK, that's great, guys. Uh, Do you ever think about the discovery issues for the prosecution team? And there was dead silence. And nobody had thought, oh my gosh. We have discovery obligations that are going to implicate body-worn camera. So the city funded a unit, and we call it our evidence review unit. It was um, formed in, as a test in November of 2015, and it consists of Sandy Goldthorpe, who is our division chief. We have four ASAs, eight law clerks, and three paralegals. The important thing about the ASAs is every new attorney in the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office must go through ERU. And that's because we want our new attorneys to experience what's going on in the community through body-worn cameras. And there are a list of, of issues that we deal with in the community and how to teach the new attorneys how to interact with the community, how to look at the problems in the community, and also how to interact with the police and how the police interact with the community. So um, in terms of body-worn camera, we receive all videos that result in an arrest and charges and serious traffic violations. Um, so since the inception of body-worn camera, we've received over 220,000 body-worn camera videos. Those are videos from the Baltimore Police Department. Okay. So how do we use body-worn cameras? Remember, case is already charged. So our ASAs, in, uh, we, we have a case management system. So our body-worn camera unit will assist the ASAs by locating, uploading, we redact videos, and we put that into the case management system for their case. So our case management system has a case and we are basically preparing the body-worn camera video for them to see. And it's uploaded into their electronic case, and it's there for them uh, to look at. We also do redactions, and we tag. We tag particular places on the video to alert the attorney, look at this. But our office policy is every attorney must look at all the body-worn camera video. We also use our body-worn camera video for police accountability. And this goes both ways. It goes to helping the police, and it also goes to, mm -mm, we got a problem with the police. Uh, we use it to review police-involved shootings. We use it to train our ASAs on constitutional issues. So we often have video trainings of unconstitutional <laughs> searches, seizures, stops, and what do you do, and how do you recognize that? And then finally, we train our ASAs in uh, 
on policy, on the police policy procedures. Excessive force. What is excessive force? Does this video show excessive force? Do you need to notify somebody else in our police integrity unit and whatever other policies that the police puts out? Okay. So, what happens in terms of case preparation that takes all our time? Well, our police department is supposed to dock and label their uh, videos by CC number, which is our location number. However, that doesn't always happen. So the body worn camera unit will uh, look for and get missing videos. Um, we tag videos, we redact videos. This is interesting. Um, we've been able to develop, uh, if we see CDS being recovered, we have another person in the unit that tracks that CDS and we immediately get the request in to our analysis so that we can get the request back. We've had some difficulty in Baltimore City of doing timely uh, analysis, completion of analysis. We do the same thing for firearms. Those analysis and those firearm reports are automatically downloaded by the body worn camera unit into that electronic case file and are ready for the, um, the ASAs for case preparation. And then we have, um, if you see on the body worn camera that there is a, uh, a transport of a prisoner and there was some issue with that, the, uh, the transport vans have video not related at all to body-worn camera, um, but we can request those videos. All right, now, this is one of the situations where we had um, police accountability. And I'm not gonna start this video until um, everybody takes a good look and sees that this police officer is holding, um, if I can work on this, is holding a can, okay? And in the can is, what we believe is uh, CDS. This case uh, garnished national attention um, because on, our body, on the body-worn cameras, there's a buffer, uh, which means that the police don't know that it's being recorded for 30 seconds until they actually turn their camera on. Their camera stays on, but for recording purposes. This officer had his camera on. He hit recording, but it buffers back 30 seconds, and this is what we got. Um, this is a case in which the state's attorney's office brought charges against this officer for fabricating evidence. We have a statute uh, in, in Maryland which s states that uh, a person who fabricates physical evidence in order to impair its verity um, with the intent to deceive commits a crime. This particular police officer didn't record the actual recovery of the drugs. So what he did was he decided to go back and reenact it. Okay, I'm with you. Except he failed to tell everybody that he reenacted it. So he had submitted a video for charging, I mean, for case preparation, without telling our office that he had recreated this video. And in fact, he didn't tell us until he got questioned by the defense and by us about what happened in this video. This video shows him recreating it. He is actually putting the drugs back into the can, putting the can back to where he found it, and then recovering it all over again. So go ahead. He did this because he didn't put his body-worn camera um, on, and he didn't want to be dinged uh, by the, the administrative um, organization for BPD, so he recreated a video. What we did was we brought charges against him, and a week ago, it was a bench trial, the judge returned a verdict of, of guilty for both violating the statute and for misconduct. So we do use our body-worn camera to keep the police accountable, but we also use our body-worn camera to exonerate police. And in particular, in a, um, in a shooting we had, we have about, I don't know, eight to 12 a year. Um, this is a, a particular shooting which we were having difficulties with. I was having difficulties with, was there a gun? Why is he shooting somebody who's running away? It was a very dicey sort of um, issue. So here's the body-worn camera. Um, it goes very quickly. Down, luckily. 
Two shots fired. Get over here. Pennington in the rear. I think he on. I think he on the ground. He, he getting up. He getting up. He's running that way. Elm Street and Pennington. So in this particular case, um, I was concerned about a police officer um, pulling his gun and shooting somebody and then continuing to shoot somebody while they were running away down the alley. When we used the body-worn camera, both in stills and in slowing it down, we found out what actually happened. The police officer, they were, they were walking and trying to, um, to apprehend this defendant because they had seen him with a gun. And what had happened was they were chasing him, and when you saw the officer go down, he actually luckily fell down. Because at that exact time, he turned and he pulled an object in, out in his hand and he pointed it at the police officer. Now, of course, the next question I have is, well, what was the object? The body-worn camera doesn't necessarily show us a very good picture about the object, but it's clear in his actions that he's pointing a gun. Unfortunately, we didn't recover a gun on him. And we didn't recover a gun in the alley. Mom was saying it was a cell phone. And we meet with all of our, um, our families when we have police-involved shootings. This was not a fatal shooting. So what we did was we combed through the body-worn camera, and we found out that, in fact, another officer who was walking down the alley who was with the other officer who was shooting, had captured the gun on his body-worn camera. By the time the incident was over and they were able, and the police were able to show up and sort of secure it, the gun was gone. But we were confident that this gun in the middle of the alley was the gun that this particular person had. So um, in this particular case, we declined to prosecute. And, in, and we held, uh, we were able to help the police officer, and the story showed that he was justified in a shooting. Yeah? Is there a reason that his hand was over the lens of the camera? So their body worn cameras are right here. So unfortunately, when they shoot, they shoot this way. He fell down. Um, and then when he got up, he was adjusting his body worn camera. And they also, when they, have, they put their hand up this way, they're activating it. Okay, so the cameras are on, they hit a button to record, we get a look back of 30 seconds. So oftentimes you'll see them do this, but we'll get 30 seconds prior to that. It's called a buffer. Okay, so. Is that also where they have microphones in Ben, or where he's using his talking No, they're usually right, like right about here. So, okay. Well, what we also do with body worn camera, um, is we teach our, uh, our new ASAs. We have constitutional training. I'm just going to go through this very quickly because I know I'm, I'm short on time. But this was uh, an excerpt from a state of a probable cause. It basically looks like the police uh, walked up to somebody, to two guys, and said, hey, you know, what are you doing? And they said, uh, oh, I just got some weed on me. And then, of course, the whole stop becomes a big thing. Well, the body point camera actually showed this. Hi, Relax. Relax. 
Relax. Yeah, I'm Relax. Fucking, they're gonna Relax. Put in here Why and see what goes on. Just talk up. We're gonna have a problem. Relax. You're being video recorded. You know you're recording. Just stop. Here's our world. Have a seat. Kick your legs out. What's in the satchel? This is my home phone. I got some weed. Smell the weed. Oh, that's fine. What else in there? You said 4743, bro. And it's fine. So what the body one camera actually showed us what the police officers were just accosting two individuals walking down. They had no reasonable and articulable suspicion to stop them. They stopped them. They ordered them to sit down. They had a show of force. And then they entered into a conversation with them. They asked them what was in the, the little pouch. They took the pouch and they opened it up and they found the drugs. Completely different than what the statement of probable cause says and a constitutional violation of those individuals' rights. This case was kicked. So we use this type of training to show our ASAs, look, you have got to look at the body-worn camera and you have to think about the constitutionality of the stops. All right, so, um, like I mentioned before, one of the important things for our ASAs to understand is they need to know what the tension is between the police and the community. And so we, we require them to go through body-worn cameras so they can see the treatment of suspects, so they can tr see the treatment of citizens, <coughs> so they can see that there are strip searches that are going on that may or may not be appropriate, um, that they can see uh, if this is a use of force that's excessive or not excessive. And then finally, we also uh, report incidences to uh, internal affairs um, through uh, our police integrity unit. All right, so here are our ongoing challenges. Uh, we have an enormous amount of video to review, and again, like David, we don't have the, the staff to do it. Um, one of the things I think that if we had looked back at this, we would have realized that our prosecutors now have a huge burden, because they are looking at massive amounts of video, and we did not calculate that in. Um, our detectives also use their body-worn cameras for interviews. And then sometimes they don't tag them, and we end up having Brady material sitting out there that we don't know of. Um, failing to record and turning on cameras late, we still have that issue, but we report them to IA. Um, discovery issues, if they don't use the right title, we have to go back, um, Sandy's unit goes back and tracks down what the videos are. And then finally, the defense. Unfortunately, nobody really sat down and talked to our defense bar and said, you have got, you've got to have the technology available to um, use and to view body-worn camera. And our Office of the Public Defender, uh, they, need it, they need bigger broad width. They need a lot that they don't have. And so they're constantly complaining about, it takes me two hours just to download it. I get it. I'm sorry. Um, and, and obviously, we wish that everybody had gotten together a little bit more and um, provided better advice as to the technology that the defense bar is going to use. So that's how we use body-worn camera in the Baltimore City State's Attorney's Office. Um, it's very eye-opening, um, and, and I think it's a, it's a good thing because it keeps the police accountable, but it also helps the police. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Sure. Anybody have any questions? So uh, in Baltimore City, uh, the Baltimore Police Department has their own administrative um, hearings. They're called trial board hearings. Um, and we will provide the video to internal affairs, and, and it's up to them to decide what they're going to do um, in terms of presenting evidence at the trial board. We report them. We say, this is an issue. You need to correct this. Uh, and it's up to them. We have at this point, which is really good um, progress in our relationship with, with BPD, when we have a case that even is more severe than this, um, if we have a case where we really don't believe that the officer, say, he saw somebody throw the gun and we can see from the body-worn camera that he didn't, um, we now have a procedure where we report it to uh, BPD legal 
and they take, take steps to take the person off the street until we complete our investigation. And will you use that, those determinations in bringing filing charges in the future involving those same officers? It, it's case by case. On the, uh, the one video that I just sh showed you, we did. Uh, we have two other ones that we're investigating. Um, it depends on, on the scale. Like, is this something that was an unconstitutional um, search and seizure and we should just dismiss the case? Um, or is this a situation where the police officer um, was untruthful in their statement or probable cause? Oh, go ahead. So, um, sure. So, um, homicide, our homicide unit likes to look at their own videos. So that cuts down on some. Um, our gun, who else uses their own videos? Just for you. Um, our you. special victims unit likes to look at their own videos. Um, and you. And our major investigations unit likes to look at their own videos. So that cuts down on some of the videos that we have to do. We upload those for the, for the prosecutors. So it's right there in the file. Uh, Sandy does a great job with her unit. And literally, they sit there for 7.3 hours or more and watch videos. Um, we have law clerks watching videos. We have uh, ASAs watching videos. And we have paralegals watching videos. We also have deputies watching videos. Uh, we have division chiefs watching videos if we need the help. Um, and they do a triage in the sense that they'll look, they'll pull the statement of probable cause, um, they'll look at the statement of probable cause in the video, they'll tag it, if they see any emergency issues, they'll uh, notify the appropriate, they'll notify Sandy, and then Sandy will notify the appropriate division chief. Um, but it is, it is a quick process. It is not a process um, that an ASA should, should say, I don't need to look at the videos. Um, they have to look at the videos. So most of, of what we do now is uh, district court. Um, obviously, uh, guns, guns and drugs, they get in, filed in district court or they get elevated. Uh, a general felony, so general felony crimes we do. Um, that's we, about it. Yeah, we, we focus on especially guns and drugs cases, and we get notified from that from our central booking unit. So we know the day after someone's been arrested with either which cases to report. Under the current under the current research, there there was no reason that was asked or given when um, they were not viewed or when they were viewed before filing and charges were rejected. So that begs for further research into that issue. And unfortunately, given the lack of current research in the effect of body worn cameras on prosecutions, it hopefully um, other research projects will develop and other agencies will allow researchers to come in and, and evaluate that question. There could be reasons such as even if, and I think in Los Angeles, there might be a difference between what the camera sees because ultimately it has a fixed field of view and does, for example, if I'm looking at you right now, the camera's going to look directly at you, but I could also see everything else that's going on in the room. So the officer might have observed what they said occurred in the report, but the camera didn't capture it because the camera is only looking at whatever field of view is straight ahead. And therefore, even if the camera doesn't contradict the officer, it doesn't necessarily corroborate the officer. And in Los Angeles, a jury may not be willing to convict based upon 
evidence that the camera didn't pick up because then they would have to believe what the officer said happened actually happened. So that's, that's just one reason that that might explain that, but again, it, it will take further research to know the reasons behind that number. Any further questions? Yes. I believe the answer is yes, that given the fact that anything and everything that they're doing is, is on camera, and in Los Angeles, the buffer was extended from 30 seconds to, to two minutes um, in December of 2017, that their interactions with individuals that they encounter out in the field, I believe, is different they realize that they're on camera. By the same token, the, the actions of the people that they're encountering are also different because of the fact that our officers are wearing cameras. Yes? Well, I, I can tell you that uh, we do not do that. Um, and I believe that our body-worn camera state legislation does not allow us to do that. Um, the, the use of body-worn camera video um, in uh, the state was a negotiation between the ACLU and various other partners um, in the state. So um, that's my recollection of I do not know. Um, I know Axon has established an, an AI board to guide it in its decision making going forward because of the amount of data that is collected through body worn cameras, such as people's faces. Uh, I do, given that we deal with it on the prosecution side, I don't know what Axon has offered LAPD potentially, but. Ultimately, given everything that is being captured on the cameras, that is a technological possibility. Whether or not Axon actually uses that and whether any law enforcement agencies use that, that's, I think, um, a subject for future conversation. <laughs> for sure. Um, so I think we're at the end. I'd like to thank our panelists for a fabulous presentation. We are at the home stretch. We are at the coveted uh, 11, it was supposed to be 11.45, the, the 11.50 to 12.50 hour. My uh, dear friends, so, so first we can talk about Carrie. I started and started to hear about Carrie, not in the Bronx, but in Manhattan, and, and that area of intelligence-driven prosecution. How can we use data? How can we make decisions? And very much so, I think the entire strategy is how do we make things safer? when we look at things like gun violence and, and, and uh, different areas of the community. How do we do that? How do we also merge and work with our communities uh, toward that common goal? With Carmen, I think I, I knew of him with, with CCI, uh, but it was his work when he came to first the Bureau of Justice Assistance at, at USDOJ, and then his work in the White House. And um, what a great voice for prosecutors and always that question, and that's what I appreciate with, with Carmen, is he, he did come from the outside a little bit as it relates to prosecutors, but always pushing that why. Why are you guys doing that? Mm -hmm. Can't we do things differently? And also the strategic. Where are we going in, in five years, in 10 years? Where are we gonna be at? Um, because we really don't wanna worry too much about today, especially with national strategy. It's, it's what's the future? The both of them are now in the Bronx office. Um, probably one of the finest uh, DA's offices in the country, uh, but, a, but an office that might be a little bit, or at least in the past, was, was Carmen, what did you say, 1975? 
or you're 85 now? We're moving up, 86, we'll go it, with. It, it, so, <laughs> so we've gone from 75 to 86 in about a year, um, but where are they gonna take it? But I, I really was looking forward to this presentation because it is that combination of uh, folks that have been involved in moving one office going into a very different office and how can that change coupled with the national strategy. How does this work in the mosaic that is our country? So, Carrie and Carmen, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, good morning, thanks for staying for us. We appreciate it. Um, so what Carmen and I are gonna talk about a little bit today is what it's like to go to work for a progressive-minded DA um, who's still in her first term in office after taking over an office from a DA who was in office for over 25 years. And um, I, thought, I thought this morning the comment about um, urgency just kind of made me laugh. I'm sure it made a lot of you in here laugh because um, our DA, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, is, is very progressive, wants to make changes, has made changes, um, but we live with the urgency literally every day. Nothing is going fast enough. Um, um, nothing that we wanna do can be implemented as quickly as we wanna implement it. I'm sure you all feel this. Um, you have a great idea, it completely makes sense. You know how to get there, and then months later, you're still working on it. So, so that's really what we're gonna talk about today, um, what it's like to, to have the, the vision, and, and DA Clark has the vision, and, and have the office uh, and, and the crime in your jurisdiction, and to wanna do it, but the urgency of now is really um, bearing down, and it's uh, in an office that, that it's infrastructure, both data infrastructure and just um, organization, if you will, is really not set up for the changes that, that you wanna make. So a little bit of background, um, just in case people aren't as familiar with the Bronx. We have about 1.4 million residents, 57 square miles. Um, we are connected uh, to, to Manhattan and Queens. Um, I'm sure as everybody knows, there are five DA's offices in New York City. We are one of them. They all have their own elected DA. Um, but we work uh, with one, basically one uh, law enforcement partner, NYPD. You can see a little bit about our median income. What's important to know really is that um, we have, uh, we have a, a, a community that struggles uh, in terms of um, having a large percentage or, uh, or significant percentage who are impoverished. And so what's our crime like? Um, you can see from the slide, um, we have some year-to-date uh, information right there now. Um, what's interesting about the, um, the data that you see up there is where we've come from the past. So uh, we have about 17% of the city's population, but we have about 21% of major crime. Um, so, so each year, year over year, although the, the, the resident population hasn't changed that much, we, we tend to have a higher percentage of violent crime in the city. Last year, we, we had about 20,000 index crimes, and our office took in over 53,000 arrests. Um, the, the, the chart that you see at the bottom shows our homicides. So in 2000, we had 190 homicides. We had 72 last year. Um, that was a 62% decline, and that's really remarkable. I mean, it's truly like, I almost feel like when we talk about this, you have to pause for a minute. It's truly remarkable to have had 72 homicides. Unfortunately, we're already beyond that. So um, last year, right for right now, is kind of our record year. Um, but to put that in context, you know, when people talk about the amazing crime decline in New York City, we always go back to the early 1990s. You know, 1990, New York City had over 2,000 homicides. Um, we had almost 550 in the Bronx that year. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in 2000, when, when the crime decline was already, you know, in swing, uh, there were 673 homicides in New York City, and there were only 292. We, we, we went under the 300 mark for the first time last year. So it really truly has been a, a, a big crime decline, but the Bronx still has a lot of violent crime. We uh, had 75 uh, true homicides, over 75 already year to date. You can see what our non-fatal shootings look like, hundreds, and so, and so we have some work to do, and this is really where we're putting most of our effort. So you can see a picture of DA Clark. As I said, she's in her first term. Um, we are the fifth largest prosecutor's office in the country. We have a little over 550 lawyers and 500 support staff. 
Um, we are going to talk about the challenges of progress uh, and, 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 and really kind of get into the weeds. Happy to hear um, questions about that as we go along and honestly happy to hear ideas as well. But it is really amazing what DA Clark has, has managed to do already in just these three years. So um, the, the structure of the Bronx DA's office really hadn't changed much in the 25 years. It was a horizontal office. The prior DA didn't keep a computer on his desk. Um, there are uh, real data challenges. Um, since she's been in office, uh, she has taken the office vertically. So we are now a fully vertical misdemeanor through felonies office. Um, we believe in vertical prosecution. Re it reduces delays. We believe it's more responsive to the community. We believe that those cases are infused with intelligence by the same ADA having them through. Um, she created a crime strategies unit, which if you've seen me talk before, you know I feel really strongly about, having uh, been the chief of CSU in Manhattan. Um, we did have a unit in the office uh, prior to DA Clark uh, taking office that was called the Crime Strategies Case Enhancement Unit. And I think it's important to note the change in title because um, it's, a, it's, it's a topic for a longer conversation, but crime strategies shouldn't just be about enhancing cases, right? It should be um, justice, it should be community outreach, um, it should be lowering crime by doing the right thing. Um, DA Clark's mission statement is pursuing justice with integrity. So one of the things she's done is changed um, crime strategies case enhancement unit to CSU. She's also started an alternatives to incarceration bureau. Um, a, conviction, a conviction integrity unit. Um, the Bronx is charged with, we, we have jurisdiction over all the crimes that uh, occur in Rikers Island. Um, and so that includes obviously inmate on inmate violence and anything having to do with correction officers, either violence against corrections officer or corrections officers committing crimes. Um, surprisingly, I think, um, th those were just kind of coming into the office. She's created a Rikers Island Prosecution Bureau. Um, we have undertaken bail reform. Um, we are currently undertaking a full audit, if you will, policy, sea change around misdemeanor charging. Uh, we now have a reentry initiative, um, and we've started a technical investigations unit to, to kind of bring up our office's capability of, uh, of um, having evidence from cell phones, hard drives, uh, video footage from the community, all the, all the technical things that we'll get a little bit more into, into detail about. But I think what's notable and why I wanted to list for you all of those changes is when we started working on this presentation and I listed out um, what has happened in three years of a change in administration, it, it struck me that I was about to talk about all the challenges Carmen and I face in, in, the, in, in getting to the path where we want to be, and then I started listing the changes that have already been made, and I was stunned that in three years you can move an office like this. I mean, just, I, I can tell you, I've been there nine months, so I wasn't even in the office when, when she turned the office vertically. Um, I will say I've been there long enough to see that it's like moving a battleship. It has just been, extremely hard, it's for the right reason. As you can imagine, there's been some level of pushback um, and we're staying the course, she's committed to it and it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna take a longer, it's gonna take a fairly long time but, but, but this is where we're heading. So I wanna pause here. Um, how many of you in the audience have a arrest alert system in your office? Someone's got <laughs> <laughs> One, maybe two. And how many of you have a case management system? How many of you have an off-the-shelf case management system? I mean, you, you bought a product from a, co a tech company and just implemented it. One or two. So we, Carrie and I come in the office. I have been there a little bit over a year, almost two years at this point. And we come in knowing that the technology within the office is not 21st century, but we were unaware of the technology that was, as Dave made a joke, 1986. We have uh, all of our technology since uh, the previous DA has been in office has been homegrown or has been built with a three or four person IT department. What that means is that when the, the systems, the tech that was built 15 years ago, it served the purpose of managing cases so that attorneys were not using spreadsheets, were not writing down their cases for their bureau chiefs on a 
clipboard and then posting it in the office. But that has left us as we're trying to advance the office into the 21st century without the analytical and technical capabilities to really think through what we're doing and using data to drive policy. Um, that presents two challenges. So we have, what you see here is a, a screenshot of our case management system, which literally just lists cases. That, that's helpful for one reason, because you can see all of your cases that are assigned to each individual DA, but we can't analyze what we are doing within our own office with accuracy. That requires us to then rely on other uh, stakeholders and partners data within the criminal justice system, such as the Office of Court Administration, the police department. We have an overarching uh, agency, which many of your states do. It's the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council or the State Administering Agency. We in New York call it the Division of Criminal Justice Service. They have additional data. Um, we, we rely on our partners in the defense bar to help us provide data. But when you look at all that data, none of it matches. So I can't today tell you um, with good 100% accuracy or betting um, or gambling on it that we know how many cases that have come into our office, how many cases have been disposed, how many have pled guilty versus been found not guilty. When you're trying to create policy, the DA, as Carrie mentioned, uh, is very uh, progressive. She really wants to push the envelope look at issues such as bail reform, look at issues such as alternative to incarceration, which fall within carrying my portfolio. But how can you have those conversations? How can you begin to work with your partners in the police department when you can't even look at your data and say, 700 people have been arrested this year for low level drug possession. So Carrie and I, and, and thanks to District Attorney Clark and, and the entire team, and it's not about us, it's about the entire team, have really started to go back and begin to marry data sets. Um, within our office and within our partners so that we aren't relying on anecdote. I, I told this, this story to Carrie last night in the, when we were having dinner is, I come, come from a place in DC where I was quizzed on um, numbers and data and we were expected. And, and my former principal said to me, on page 56 of your report, you quoted that it was 4,000 cases, but you're telling me it's 3,950. What's the difference? To me, that is very important, and to the district attorney, that's very important that we're relying on the most accurate data and that we can go to the public and we can say, this is how many cases we've processed, this is how many cases have been, or individuals have been found guilty and versus non, not guilty. And we've talked a lot about improving public trust and confidence in the justice system, and the DA's mission is to pursue justice with integrity. But in order to do that, we need to be transparent. We need to tell the public what we're doing, how we're doing it, how we're using their taxpayer dollars and how we're serving their community. So data is really the critical piece that pulls that all together. Yeah, click it because I think, yeah. And so just um, very quickly, that's what our arrest alert system looks like. I, I came from an office that had a, a robust arrest alert system that we had worked really hard with IT um, to build and, and to transform into something that an end user could really um, uh, make in the moment and actionable. Um, we even had NYPD as a subscriber to our arrest alert system. Um, and I figured, given the large IT department at the Manhattan DA's office um, and the kind of uh, uh, importance that have been placed on, on building these kinds of things, that I, I figured when I got to the Bronx that um, it might not be as, as good or we might have some work to do. I was pleasantly surprised to find that the in-house built arrest alert system in the Bronx DA's office was, was quite good, and it has a, it has a lot of... Um, pieces to it that were clearly thought through and, and very different from Manhattan. Um, what was interesting is that it wasn't being utilized effectively at all. Um, and there were parts of it that weren't being utilized at all. I mean, literally there are like um, these notes sections where you can add in why a person might be important to you um, and, and you can link it to things and just it, it wasn't used at all. So there's also this interesting um, back and forth between Sure, you, you, might, you might need tech, but then if you build tech and you don't use it effectively or if, it, if it's not actionable, then what's the point? So, so, so we have this arrest alert system and people were getting arrest alerts via email and they were deleting them because they weren't meaningful and they had no idea why they were getting it. And, um, and so we've, we've really worked hard on saying if, if we have arrest alerts and we don't want to fill people's email boxes up with interesting information, but instead actionable information, what does that look like? Who, who are you um, 
subscribing to that, what does it look like? So I think it, it's a two-pronged approach. And then just kind of the last thing I'll note on this slide is where you see the anecdotes bullet. Um, if you're in an office that doesn't trust its uh, data or, or, or isn't data-driven, and RDA is extremely data-driven, she's not going to set a policy and not ask for um, what has been going on, um, what, what did we do in 2017, what did we do in 2016 to support this, um, then unfortunately policy becomes anecdotal. Um, then you've got a bunch of people sitting around a meeting talking about um, what disposition the office routinely gets on this crime. And I've been in enough of those meetings in both offices to know that if you can really drill down on the data, those anecdotes are almost always wrong. They are maybe set in policy everybody wants to believe is followed, but we have 500 lawyers, we have tons of supervisors, um, obviously, <laughs> crime incidences have fact patterns that are different, and so um, we, we really, uh, we are all on the same page in the Bronx DA's office about this, is that these progressive policies that she has set in place or that she wants to set in place, they have to be data-driven, and they have to be data-driven with data that you actually trust. And before we move one last thing to the slide is I want you to remember this arrest alert system because a lot of the initiatives that Carrie and I are going to talk about today would not be possible or we could not provide the services that we want without the arrest alert system. So we'll come back to that. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we, have, we have made huge strides, and um, I think that's because the philosophy of the office is to progress and to build some of these things. And, and back to what DA Krasner said, it's urgent. We need to be doing it. Um, and so these are just a few examples of what, of what we've been doing really in, in kind of like the last year, year and a half. Um, at the top, you see a, um, you see a map with a, with a whole bunch of icons on it, the colorful one. Um, that's something that literally went live last month. Um, we did not have the tech in the office to really do this. I'll explain what it is. But um, one of the ways that we have started working hard on data plus policy plus uh, tools to our ADAs and, and support staff is by hiring um, analysts. Um, I've talked about analysts before, if you've, if you've heard me talk about crime analysts. But really, it goes back to the idea that we are just these whiz kids that get out of college. Um, a lot of times they have computer science degrees, sometimes they have criminal justice degrees, but took a bunch of, of uh, computer classes, and they're also, you know, 24 years old, so they just are Excel experts. Um, but hiring them and, and really kind of explaining the criminal justice system and then saying, but this is what we need to build. Um, how do we do this? Can you investigate what flat platform we would do it on? Um, that map is a picture of what we call uh, Bronx cams. It is a growing, we just went live, but it is a growing map, interactive map that is now live to the entire office where you can hover over an area and see what known recording cameras exist there. And um, right now, I think we have a little under 1,000. It is go it's growing exponentially each week but because the way we married that up is that the uh, video also reports to Carmen and I. And so all the video techs in the office who take the videotape statements or um, uh, go out and videotape a crime scene, they're also charged with going out to our pr private community partners and downloading footage when we learn that a crime has, uh, ha has has, has, has been captured on a camera. And so we married up this tech with the fact that they should be going out with some kind of an app or a form that they fill out in order to meet those uh, ADA needs for the investigation and of course the disclosure obligations, but it can also hit this third point where now you've identified that that, you know, Chase Bank has a working camera. We know it loops in 30 days. We know what directionability it's capturing. They fill out this form and that feeds into this camera system. So it is going to be populating as we build cases. Um, it's not a live feed. I get that question a lot when we were building it. It's not as if the ADAs can go in and see the footage. What it gives them is that we know um, that the camera exists there. Footage can be retrieved because it, we know it was retrieved in the last 30 days, 60 days, six months. It has an as of date because the video techs are putting that. And so now, hopefully, 
um, you can get the retrieval or issue a subpoena in a time that it's not going to be deleted. This obviously is, is a huge issue for DA's offices because of resources and because the fact that, that um, video footage can both strengthen a case and exculpate a defendant. And so it's important for everybody to be getting this evidence. But these private cameras especially, they loop so quickly um, that if your detective swings out and is gone for four days and then you don't you know, meet back up um, and you're not canvassing in time, how are you sure that there's a camera? So, so we are just, you know, part of the progress that we're trying to build are where are the gaps? What should we be doing? What is this justice that DA Clark is talking about and how do we fill it with tech? Um, the other thing I want to talk about is you see the form, um, which has a precinct at top and a highlighted headline. Very quickly, um, we, we really quickly um, in the spring uh, rolled out a, a violent crime report for the office. Um, and what that is, it's a daily report that goes to every supervisor, bureau chief, and particular line assistants in the office about what, which most violent crimes have been charged by our office in the last 24 hours. So it's not every crime. Um, it's not even crimes like if you're in New York City, uh, an assault too, which is, you know, an assault with a weapon, um, because so, there's so many of those, to be quite frank. We want it to be a readable snapshot of the worst of the worst. So it's robbery in the first degree, gunpoint robberies, um, assault in the first degrees, shootings, homicides, forcible rapes, um, collected in a very quick snapshot, and everybody gets that in a readable format, uh, emailed, once a day. The idea is if we are um, creating an office that is really focused on, on reducing violent crime, serving the public, every, everybody and certainly every supervisor should have a, a view of really what's coming into the office in 24 hours. Um, it's kind of a big lift, to be honest, because of, because of our case management system. It's not that easy to pull this information out in a 24-hour cycle, but we worked really hard to do it. Um, and I will tell you, people have been People who have been in the office for a very long time have even said to me, oh my God, I had no idea we had this level of violence coming in every single day. Um, it's a little shocking to kind of read the facts. Um, and, I, and I think we, you know, we hope that, it, that then those cases are, are, are getting the focus by, by the supervisors that they should get in this, in this rotating basis. Um, the bottom map is just an example of, of how we've started to collect data. That's non-fatal shootings, not, not typically the easiest thing for a prosecutor's office to collect. Um, homicides, we have a homicide bureau. Those homicide ADAs go out on every single homicide, so that's not such a significant lift to know about what homicidal incidents are happening in the Bronx. Non-fatal shootings typically are harder to find out about because they're not solved immediately all the time. They don't become cases. But of course, if you're really focused on, on serving your community, then you want to know where there is, uh, you know, where, where you are seeing a large amount of violent crime, where you're seeing homicides overlaid with non-fatal shootings, overlaid with the shots fired that you know of, overlaid with the gunpoint robberies to really start understanding how to focus your resources, um, how to engage with the community properly. So, so that's something that we just built from scratch. Honestly, we're keeping it on an Excel spreadsheet by the 28-day cycle for CompStat um, so that we're aligned and so that we can, we can check our data and so we can go back to NYPD if we feel like we're missing something. But this is going to be the basis for so many strategies that we put in place because they're going to be crime-driven. And then the last thing that you see on this slide is a data report. I think Carmen mentioned our, our um, hope to be very transparent. Um, with our community, <clears throat> and so we're working on a data report. Uh, it's, it's very challenging. Um, it's not something that we can do right now. You obviously don't want to be uh, putting out data to the community or to, to your other partners and then discover that it's not correct, um, but that is, that is the goal. That's where we're headed. And so to piggyback on what Carrie said, so we've talked a lot about how we don't have 100% confidence in our data, but we also come into an era where the district attorney's office was very siloed and did not have excellent relationships with the police department and their other criminal justice stakeholders. Because we have these data needs, it's enabled us to build relationships across um, both all sides of the system, both with our defense partners, with our police partners, um, with the courts, because we are heavily relying on them to inform us and to assist us in reducing crime. 
um, and improving justice, as, as the DA says. The, the two partnerships that I really want to mention are, and why the violent uh, crime report is so important, is in New York State, you have 24 hours to arraign. Um, the, from arrest to arraignment time, are, it is averages about 18 to 20 hours, depending on the day, depending on the volume. But this report really helps our supervisors say, oh, this individual is charged, oh, these are the facts of the case, and helps build our relationship with the police department because we have a very, or in previous administrations, we have a very high, what we call decline to prosecute rate, the highest in the city. We are now able to catch cases prior to them being arraigned or dismissed and really go back to the police department and say, this is what we need to proceed. This is why we cannot proceed. Uh, can we help out in this area, et cetera? The other, piece that Carrie mentioned is hiring really good whiz kids. Uh, we've formed a relationship uh, both uh, internally within the office, but then uh, with a local university, a historically uh, black and minority college, Monroe College, and they are providing us with uh, data interns. So these are fourth year, or sometimes juniors in college, that uh, are computer science majors. It is free to us, the students get paid they come and they complete a six to nine month internship. I think our one has stayed longer than that. And we give them a project. They're assigned a mentor through their university that helps them with all the technology. And then we as the end user say to them, this is what we want, can you build it for us? And then they go back to their university, their mentor helps them code. We then put it into our system or into our network. This didn't cost us anything, it helped the only way we did this was by building a relationship with the local university. But the outcomes have been tremendous. We created Bronx CAMS, we created the Violent Crime Report. We were able to analyze and start really focusing on a data report through the partnerships and relationships that we built with the local university as well as our police department. Um, so to go back to something Carmen said and asked everybody if they, were, if they had case management systems. Um, our case management system is in-house, as Carmen mentioned. It's really just a system that helps you know which line ADA has which case, um, what what it's you know what's charged and where in the criminal justice process it is. It, it has this nice um, feature to it that I'm not I'm not used to having come from Manhattan, where you can actually embed documents within it. So I think most prosecutors' offices, certainly those that I've been in contact with, kind of have buckets of information. Right? You have the database where um, in your complaint room you draft the cases, and then you have your case management system where it kind of plugs to after after arraignment or maybe at the time of arraignment, but now it's an active case in your office. And then you have any other database that you ever wanted to build. But everything is its own siloed bucket. Um, What's nice about our in-house built uh, case management system is that documents are actually linked up in it. So if I open up a robbery in our case management system, I can see that it's assigned to Carmen, um, that it's post arraignment. Um, and then I can go into a toggle screen and, and, and actually see his <coughs> complaint, the summary of the case, the body-worn camera footage, everything is linked in there. That's great. The bad part is that's the extent of, of what that case management can do. Can do. It um, can't do any analytics. Um, it, it's just, it, it's really just the progress of the case in the system. Our disposition data comes from um, our courts. Um, we don't currently have a, a lot of, uh, we have a couple of people like in arraignment, we don't have people sitting in every courtroom taking down the disposition. So we can't rely on the disposition. You know, we just, it, there's, there's not, you know how complicated dispositions are, right? It's like a six month jail probation split or you're gonna get a conditional discharge and this is the condition of your discharge. It's, it's more complicated and that's not being captured. So it's very hard for us to really analyze dispositions in bulk form right now. Um, the off-the-shelf software tools are just like mind-blowing at this time. So I know Denver raised their hand and I think they're working with Journal. We've had e-prosecutor in come show us a demo. Um, I know Seattle has Carpel. Um, we've had them come in. Um, if you haven't done that, because you know they're expensive, who can afford them, just do it because I loved having a full executive team meeting and then we, we uh, invited a whole bunch of other people for them to overview the demo so that everybody's minds could be blown. I mean, you are taking five or six in-house built databases in your offices and you're 
and, and, and a company is coming in to show you how they're gonna put it all in one place where you can just click through and then you go to the page where it gives you a bar chart and a beautiful pie chart. It, it, um, obviously we don't have it yet. Anybody have any idea about where we can get two or three million dollars? We'll implement it like right now. But um, when we get there, um, and that's, that's where we need to be, it's gonna be a game changer. And so um, that's just something to look forward to. Uh, yeah, I'll start. So um, innovation and increasing public, public safety. Um, so this goes back to, to again, we, we've, we have some challenges, but we're, we're moving very fast. It's very urgent. Um, and, and the DA has this, mis this mission of, of obviously doing the best we can for the community, the most justice. So some of the other things that we, we have going on right now, um, it's a very boring gray and white form that you see there. Um, but we are doing focused prosecutions, and um, when we are arraigning cases in 18 to 19 hours, it's very hard to know um, who has been arrested. So we have crime analysts, if you will, doing workups on particular defendants. We have uh, really spent a lot of time over the last six months uh, building a relationship with the NYPD. Who are our crime drivers? Um, what does that mean? Um, what do we already know about this person? Uh, with the vertical structure in place and with the speed with which we're arraigning cases, um, what is a snapshot of their criminal history, um, potentially their juvenile history, potentially their social networking um, footprint, publicly fo focused. Um, how can we really be ready to do the right thing in that case? Or, but, or we also, I should mention, we have a very young office. The average age of the ADA, line ADA in the Bronx DA's office right now is about three and a half years. So we also want to put things in place that, that make it possible for particular and, and fairly few significant defendants to get a second look in the office since they might be being, you know, critical legal decisions might be being made by people who've been in the office between six months and two years. Um, if you've got a real crime driver coming in, no matter what the charge is, this might be a moment in time to have somebody uh, with, with more experience taking a look at it. And so, so we're pivoting our resources, our data, and now our relationship building that we've done to kind of uh, give, give those particular people um, a, a snapshot so that we can, we, we can take a good, quick look. So, so the second uh, bullet there, the opioid overdose um, and the opioid epidemic, it's, it's throughout the country we're facing an epidemic and a crisis related to opioids. The district attorney speaks a lot, and it's very interesting within our first couple of weeks uh, working in the Bronx DA's office is how different the epidemic is in the Bronx. Um, the opioids, uh, if you look across uh, the borough to Staten Island, the population that is overdosing there is, is 20 years old, 25 years old. It's young white men. In the Bronx, the average person that overdoses is 45 years old and has been addicted since the Vietnam War era. We, when we, when District Attorney came in, District Attorney Clark came in office, she really wanted to focus on this as one of her policy platforms. Uh, growing up in in one of the housing developments, the Soundview projects, she saw firsthand how the opioid and the heroin epidemic crush the community and how it's still happening here. If we were a state, if the Bronx was lined up as one of the 50 states, we would have the 17th highest overdose rate in the country. 345 people died last year uh, of an opioid overdose. Um, the average number of times that that person was arrested was 7.42. So we were able to analyze data coming from our partners, from the Office of the Medical Examiner, from the Police Department, and really look at who was overdosing in our county and what their history was, and then started to develop a strategy. So the first thing that we did was we pulled, the district attorney pulled together a working group um, of everybody from the police department to the fire department to our, our partners at the defense bar, the Bronx Defenders, as well as uh, legal aid services, the courts. But then she brought in every hospital and healthcare provider in the county and said, what is everybody doing in the Bronx? And where can we focus our efforts? Because unlike in other jurisdictions where we may be able to give a naloxone kit or we may be able to give some education, these people that are overdosing have gone through treatment on average nine times and are still overdosing. And where are we missing them? She developed, uh, which is the first uh, in, the, in the state of New York uh, 
voluntarily drug treatment program called the Overdose and Avoidance Recovery Program. What is different, this is not a drug court. This is not uh, Dan Satterberg's lead program in Seattle. It's kind of in the middle. If you are arrested for drug possession in the Bronx, we assess you uh, for risk of overdose using a scale that the New York University created for us, basically looking at how, are you currently using over opioids? Have you overdosed in the last six months? Have you been in the hospital? Or have you been recently been released from a correctional facility where they were providing you medication assisted treatment? Looking at those factors, if you are at high risk of overdose, we say, we're gonna pause your criminal case and offer you treatment. If you want the treatment, you can take the treatment and we'll pause the criminal case as long as you need to get yourself into treatment and into recovery. We'll offer you the services that you need, whether that's buprenorphine treatment, medication assisted treatment, a naloxone kit, whether that's social services, like you need housing and a job, we will do that for you. And if you successfully engage, and that successful engagement is really based and tailored to your need, we'll dismiss your case. We don't want you to get another criminal case or, or a conviction because you have a health problem. We've also noticed that that, pop, that population, we've, we've served approximately 150 people, that 1,000 to 1,500 have been assessed this year. About 750 have been at high risk for overdose. But then there's this other population that we're seeing both in, in the Bronx, but uh, generally uh, throughout the country, and that is the individual that is, is trying an opioid for the first time. Maybe it's their first time getting arrested. And we know that the, the opioids and the heroin and the cocaine that is coming into the Bronx is laced with fentanyl. We wanna make sure that we are providing you with an opportunity to go into recovery services. So we also created a program similar to what Mr. Satterberg is doing in Seattle, which is the Heroin Avoidance and Prevention Education Program. At arrest, at the precinct, a peer navigator is meeting you and offering you services and assessment and taking you to treatment if you want that service. If you successfully complete, and we're using the same criteria, if you successfully engage in treatment or in services, then we're dismissing your case. You never have to come through the criminal justice system because we want you to get treatment. Um, so now effectively, anybody that is arrested for drug possession in the Bronx has an opportunity to be diverted out of the criminal justice system and into services, which is very innovative and very progressive for New York district attorney um, and nationally. The second piece also, we just have to give credit to Dan because in Seattle we created what is, or mimicking what they create in Seattle is in New York Project Reset. We are diverting low level cases, anything from trespass to uh, harassment or to so, I mean, literally the list of the misdemeanors that we're now diverting is so long. They're, they, they tend to be um, non-traditional victim crimes, so not assault, but um, criminal mischief, graffiti making, um, shoplifting, trespass. And we're diverting you into a restorative justice circle where your community is able, a group of community members is able to meet with a group of defendants and talk to you about the harms that are that are happening because of your actions in the community and work through with you a plan of how you're, you're gonna create or repair the harm that you've created to the community. And if you successfully complete that one hour um, community justice circle, then we, we dismiss your case. We don't want these cases coming in uh, to the criminal justice system because you have a social service need or, or you've made a mistake um, and now are facing a collateral consequence. And that is also reducing the criminal caseload of our, of our assistance in the office. We have approximately 1,500 to 2,000 of these cases that could be screened into a project reset circle every year. That's another three to five cases that's off at ADA's desk. So I just want to add something about these community circles. Um, so obviously it follows a, uh, follows a restorative justice um, plan and uh, we were piloting it uh, we are still piloting, but we're about to expand it Bronx-wide. We were piloting it in particular precincts. I went to a five-hour training on last Friday, a week ago today, um, and everybody in the training was either a prosecutor, a defense attorney, or a police officer because, you know, we, we these are our stakeholders, really, um, as we imagine going full borough, and there, were, there was a lot of skepticism in the room. Um, 
beginning to end, it ultimately takes about two hours for the defendant to complete the, the circle and, um, and ultimately get their case dismissed. And so there were people in the room that were saying, I don't really see how if you just do this for two hours, you know, it's, it equals a, a, a dismissal or that the fact that you've never been arrested kind of. And at the end, bar none, um, everybody, including the most skeptical um, in the room, were like, oh no, it's enough. I mean, it was, if you haven't had an opportunity to really, I'd read about restorative justice, I talked to people who knew about restorative justice, I'd heard people make jokes about peacemaking circles. Um, it was such an experience, I can't, I can't tell you what a convert I am. I, I also was like so exhausted after the five hours um, that I can really see what, what's going on um, when our offenders are going to, to go in there. But back to the, the data part, um, when, so it's part of our alternatives to incarceration bureau. When, when Carmen and I were sitting down to walk through how the pilot had gone and where we want to go next as we expand uh, borough wide, the numbers weren't that great. We were kind of like, why are this, you know, this large number of people being screened, but this much smaller number of people um, taking part in these in these justice circles, especially since we really believe that this, that this is an answer um, for some people. Um, and it turns out because the criteria for who could take part in these restorative justice programs meant that they could, it, they could not have a prior conviction. Um, and we are in the Bronx, and these are low-level recidivist-type misdemeanor crimes, and we have a history of, uh, to some extent, being over-policed and over-prosecuted, and so who's getting arrested for shoplifting? people who have already committed a crime in their past. And so um, we're not right there just yet. We've, we've told NYPD that we want to go beyond first conviction. I don't think it's gonna be a problem, so I'm, I know this is live streaming. Um, but, um, but you know, for that really to be effective, like you have to really be able to kind of pull in the people that you think it's gonna be effective for. And, and you know, it concerns me that if you're taking first conviction shoplifters, there's gonna be some number of defendants that are gonna say, I don't know why you're having a faith-based leader, um, a business owner, and a resident of my community telling me how I'm victimizing this community with that you know, lipstick I just shoplifted. I'm never gonna do that again, right? The idea is that it really almost should be, it should be the reset of this. You should be saying like, cut it. We don't want this anymore. Tell us why you're doing it. Tell us how we can help. Let's talk this through. Um, and so that was a real, for me, that was a real moment where the data and the policy had to be, had to be together for us to decide what was the next step in this, in this um, program that we were already really, really excited about. Um, oh, to, to, uh, one other quick thing about um, alternatives to incarceration and, and the vision for the DA. We have a, um, we are doing a diversion program for violence in the Bronx. Um, I think that this is um, a topic that, that everybody's talking about. I think it's a topic that people should be talking about a lot more, um, obviously. If we are, especially in New York, if we're going to decarcerate more, um, we are going to have to get real about how we um, institute uh, alternatives to incarceration programs for people who commit violent offenses. Um, and for, for us, uh, going down this road um, with common justice, uh, data is playing a big role in it because we are early days and we, I think we have about a dozen people in the program. Um, but how do you select them, right? In an office our size, it, it can't be because a defense attorney makes a phone call to the right supervisor or because a, um, a, a more progressive ADA who, who was really paying attention when we did an office-wide training on common justice makes a phone call to the ATI Bureau. There has to be some um, methodical and fair way of going through the thousands of cases that we get to decide what should be screened, what should be considered, what are the next steps that we're going to require of our conversations with the defense attorney before deciding. And so every single policy, every single pr uh, progress that we're trying to make in the office is met with this need for data and then for a need to put a process in place that feels fair. Um, the other thing I think we're, we're in fairly early days but really proud about and, and very close to, to our heart is our um, Bronx uh, reentry initiative. So um, 
So I, I would say um, reentry for DA Clark is really kind of a two-pronged um, initiative. Uh, pre-entry, and by pre-entry, I mean really rethinking and owning a prosecutor's role in pre-entry, right? So it's all the things we've kind of touched on before, because there is no re-entry if you're not putting someone in jail or prison. So bail reform, um, misdemeanor disposition outcomes, felony disposition outcomes, who's going to jail, who, who are you recommending jail and prison for, is that meeting with the policy and the directive that the DA has put out with the office. Trust but verify those things. And that, and we have to own that, that's us. Reentry is really a collaboration, right? We've gotta collaborate with the organizations in our community that are really the experts in helping um, people who are coming home from prison reintegrate into our community. And so in that way, we are part of a task force. Uh, we get together um, every month. It's a giant meeting of professionals who work in this space, law enforcement, um, and we, it, similar to, to the work that we're doing around the opioid ec epidemic, it is really a moment in time for us to discuss things and to make plans. We also host, uh, DA Clark hosts a monthly Bronx Reentry Collaborative. And that's the image that you see on the screen. It's, it, that's actually just a picture of one of the cards we hand um, the, the formerly incarcerated attendees to this collaborative um, before they leave. And in essence, it is a welcome home, right? Nobody is going to do well in our community if they come home and are basically told they're you know, ex-cons. Um, so we host a welcome home Bronx reentry collaborative in which law enforcement is there, the NYPD hosts it with us, parole hosts it with us, probation is with us. Um, and then we have the organizations in the Bronx who can help uh, our community members returning home from prison reintegrate, offer them uh, educational services, health services, um, anything that they could be talking about. We, we talk with them for, for about a half an hour, 45 minutes, and then we host a mini fair. Um, so NYC, um, ID NYC is there. Did you come home and you actually don't have sufficient um, state ID? come talk to them, they, they're at a table to, to talk about. That is a total work in progress. Um, the reentry, the idea of a reentry program came to Carmen and I when I joined the office. We have, we've probably not held the same monthly collaborative twice because every time we host it, we take down notes, we wanna change something and then we, so, and, and then we change it. This month, in fact on Tuesday, is November's collaborative. It's the first time that we're including parole and probationers together. We actually were hosting two. We ran the data and we found that our probationers who hadn't never been to prison, um, but this was a preventative kind of re-entry, pre-entry uh, <coughs> initiative we had, um, they looked really, really similar to the people coming home from prison, except for maybe just having one less conviction on their rap sheet. They are getting probation in New York now for a violent offense. Um, they were in the same age range um, they came from the same communities. Um, they're both being supervised. And so we, we, um, we talked to a few people that we felt like might be a little smarter than us about this. We, we, we spoke to some uh, of the organizations that we've partnered with and we said, what do you think about putting the parolees who've come home in the last few months in the same meeting with the probationers that have recently been uh, um, put on probation for a violent offense and everybody thought it was a great idea, parole thought it was a great idea. And so this is an opportunity to speak to them both about their path and to offer them services. So that's a work in progress, um, but I think it's, it's something that we both feel really strongly about. We'd love to hear more ideas, um, but it, ha it, has, it has been really transformative as we've run the data to see who's coming home and how they're reacting in, in terms of us changing. Since I got the five minute mark from John, uh, <laughs> wrapping up and Carrie chime in. So, at, looking at all these different initiatives that, that DA Clark is instituting within her office, and looking at how data is driving those initiatives, Carrie's talked a lot of today about how uh, we are an office in transition. We are continually transitioning to ensure that we are serving the public and that we are serving our office. And, and DA Clark is really committed to using the data to allocate resources. And what I mean by that is really make structural decisions within the office about how we're prosecuting cases, but then also how her, her ADAs and assistants are aligned within the office so that we can have the biggest impact on the community. 
within that, um, and I know Carrie wants to talk about it, is how we are looking at how we're charging misdemeanors within our office. The, on the left-hand side of the screen is an analysis that we did on all of our misdemeanor cases within the office that looked at the precincts where these individuals were arrested, the race of the defendant, as well as the age and the number of cases to really try to think through how we're impacting our community, how, what are the collateral consequences of, of charging these crimes, and what outcomes are we getting? Are, is, is there recidivism? Are we making an impact by arresting and processing people through the criminal justice system where they're just getting time served after arraignments because they've been incarcerated for 20 hours pending an arraignment? How can we, how can we improve public safety? How can we improve public policy within the Bronx and greater New York by looking through these data analysis. Yeah, um, I'll just add one last thing because I think, um, I think it's something that everybody should be thinking about and it goes back to that um, anecdotal information equaling policy. Um, one of the things that we're gonna find as we continue on this analysis of all of our misdemeanor crimes, especially I think of the misdemeanors, is this idea that we don't charge things um, all of the offices will, will say that. Um, for years, the Bronx did not charge a lot of crimes that other offices in New York City cry, uh, charged. Things like two feet up on a subway, um, you know, crazy, crazy things. Um, and that have now become this movement towards, um, you know, criminal justice reform. And, you know, we took a look and we were like, oh, we haven't charged those in years. Yay, we lead criminal justice reform. But there, was, but there were a lot of anecdotal stories of things we also don't charge. And so far, in its early days, but so far, that's not exactly true. Um, the, the policy has been made. Nobody in the Bronx DA's office thinks we charge those crimes. And we're not charging them in, in any large numbers. But when you've got back to these siloed databases, but when it's on the books in New York State penal law and you've got the siloed database that helps your line ADAs in the complaint room draft the case and a police officer brings in a live arrest and they open their penal law and it meets those criteria, the case gets drafted. So maybe it's to the tune of I've seen 24 cases a year. And I mean, I think it's very easy to be like, well, I mean, it is still on the books and the DA's policy has, has, has yet to be completely formulated about this particular crime. But the point is, if you don't do this audit and full understanding and take a look at what is happening, you really can't, um, you really can't effectuate that change. And so, so that's something I think almost every office should probably be doing more of. And, and just to, to close and what, Dave Levon said earlier is where do we go from here? So we, we have started this analysis, we've started, and we're in early days as Carrie mentioned, but where do we push the envelope? What's the strategy? Where are we in five years? Where are we in 10 years? And how can our data analysis is now drive that strategy for the future and really push criminal justice reform and push justice forward? So. All right, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Thanks, Dave. And the, the uh, map before with your overdoses, mm -hmm. there have been a lot of jurisdictions taking the, the uh, overdose and your shooting deaths. Mm -hmm. And those heat maps are, are uh, pretty much in sync. So something to think about is uh, where, where are your particular uh, primaries and what does it all mean? I think at this point we're looking at up. We're, we're wrapping up, right, right my friend? Um, on, on behalf of APA, I, I want to say for everyone, thank you for what you uh, were willing to do, be a part of this, to, to our speakers, for those willing to travel uh, long and far and, and, and take uh, things like a red eye uh, to get here and, and be a part of the program. Everyone's a volunteer, and we, and we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. At the, at the staff level, I, I want Angel to please stand up. So uh, many of you first started communicating about this conference uh, with Nikki on my staff. Um, APA has had a rash of pregnancies, and so <laughs> two weeks ago, uh, a rash. I don't, I don't know what's causing it. This is, this is baby number seven for us. Um, so uh, still, <laughs> we're always the last to know. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, so uh, Nikki, it has now, and, and you've probably started, started to see things from Ursula, but the one person who has been consistent through all of this here for the last couple of days 
um, and look for her as far as materials and things you want out is, is, is Angel. So Angel, we cannot do it without you. <laughs> and then on the APA side, Dan Satterberg was the one who kind of uh, started us all out with the keynote in getting this move. I'd like, um, you've heard me talk a lot, I'd like Dan to, to uh, just kind of take us home a little bit before we return it back to Penn. I just wanted to say, <clears throat> you know, this once again was a, a very useful uh, exercise to, to hear you all. We're very sloppy in our language sometimes because we talk about the criminal justice system like it's some monolithic structure, but in fact there are 3,000 counties in America, 50 states, the federal system, there's at least 3,000 different criminal justice systems, and we heard a little bit about the, the struggles in each one, or, that, or at least the, the represented ones here. Issues that affect us all, like data and technology and, and conviction integrity and officer-involved shootings and, and reducing minor offenses, the kind of at the front end being a part of the quality control about what comes into your system, body-worn cameras, recorded in, in, in interrogations, the modernization of the Bronx office, which was a fantastic story and could be a whole probably conference in and of itself. So what I do appreciate, uh, in addition to this fabulous place, is the interdisciplinary uh, structure of this. Too often we, as prosecutors, find ourselves in rooms with other prosecutors, and we don't challenge ourselves. And so to have academics, to have members of the criminal defense bar, to have federal prosecutors, city attorneys, county prosecutors, uh, and the Innocence Project here was, I think, really, really made it a richer experience for all of us, better conversations at the break and at dinner, and, and to challenge us. Uh, and, and the third thing I was really uh, interested to see last night was that the drivers in Philadelphia are just as bad as the drivers in Seattle when it snows just a little bit. Uh, and I was uh, invited to speak to uh, D.A. Krasner's office, and I even had a police escort bringing me back home, and after 45 minutes and going three blocks, I said, you just got to let me out. I'll, I'll walk the rest of the way. But uh, I want to thank John and his crew and, and, uh, uh, for the fifth, and I'm looking forward to the sixth whenever that uh, sixth annual uh, happens. Uh, I think that, that we, could, we leave here, though, with a sense that we do have the power working together, working in our own communities to shape our own individual unique criminal justice system back home and to shape it in the way that reflects our own values, reflects the people that we serve, uh, and that we can come back and share next year uh, the things that we're doing and take a few good ideas back home. Uh, and, and it's what makes the dynamic uh, nature of our work is what makes it so interesting and so rewarding. So I want to thank you for hosting us here. And thank you, David. And thank you all for coming. All right, last, last word um, is, uh, is just one of, of gratitude to all of you. Um, I have a pretty simplistic metric for, we'll send a survey out to asking for your evaluations, but I have a pretty simplistic metric for whether one of these has been successful. And it's, did I have a good time? Um, so, you know, I, I, I learned a tremendous amount. It was wonderful for you guys to be here. We really appreciate you sharing your time, your knowledge, uh, your candor. Um, and, uh, and as long as I'm being grateful for things, um, Paul and Ross, your assistance has been great, but there's a team of probably 20 people here at the law school that helped to put this on. Anna Gavin, who I think all of you have connected with at one point or another, is absolutely indispensable to us. Brittany Kiesling here uh, has helped a tremendous amount. Um, the tech folks, the webcam people, the people who make the note cards, I mean, everything, it's just really uh, a team of people. So when everybody says thank you to me, you're really saying thank you to about 25 people. And um, I and my colleagues are, are really in their debt because I, I can't tell you how many times people say, oh my gosh, you guys do such a great job. And I'm like, oh, I certainly do. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. If you uh, need lunch recommendations or help with transit, uh, you know, we'll be here um, and uh, we really appreciate your coming and we look forward to the next time we get uh, the opportunity to, uh, to learn from you and spend time with you. Thanks very much.